the Second Vatican Council opened on the 11th of October 1962, but its origin can be found in the year of 1954. In that year, Pope Pius XII appointed Giovanni Battista Montini as the Archbishop of Milan. Martini had been what's called a sostituto since 1937. Uh, that's the means actually the sub substitute. Uh, it's like the Deputy Secretary of State, and that's one of the most influential people in, in the entire Vatican. And uh, he invariably receives a cardinal's hat. But, to everyone's surprise, Montini went to Milan without one. And uh, there was no doubt in Rome that he had incurred the wrath of Pope Pius XII. But why? Alice knows, of course. I've just been reading your review. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes. Uh, and the question as to why he was sent off to Milan, virtually exiled there, it received many answers, but eventually it emerged that he'd been conducting negotiations with the Communist Party behind the back of Pope Pius XII. Now, I'm not saying in any way that Montini was a crypto-communist, but uh, he believed that dialogue and, uh, with communists and a rapprochement with them was essential, really, for the good of Italy, and that the the policy of Pius XII in condemning was far too intransigent. But Pius XII thought correctly that as the fundamental axiom of communism is atheism. It was completely incompatible with Catholicism. Therefore, any dialogue with him was pointless. And, and his policies, as John mentioned today, was generally an uncompromising condemnation. Uh, and Pius XII also took exactly the same attitude towards Protestantism. His attitude to Protestantism was rather like I was mentioning to you last year when I talked about Newman, that Protestantism and Catholicism are two different religions, not just variations of one religion. And uh, Montini had been conducting secret negotiations with the Anglicans. He used to come over to England, he'd invite them to, uh, to Italy, uh, again because he thought Pius XII was uh, too intransigent and ev everybody ought to work together for a, you know, make a better, happier world. Uh, now, there are some influential cardinals in some European countries who also believe, like Montini, that Pius XII was too intransigent and that the Church had become more open towards those outside its boundaries and that dialogue with anyone and everyone should replace confrontation. The buzzwords were that Catholics should abandon the fortress mentality or, alternatively, come out of the ghetto. Montini was the chosen liberal candidate to succeed Pius XII but Pius XII had preempted his election by not appointing him as a cardinal. Thus, when this great pope died in 1958, the liberals had a problem, because uh, they couldn't elect their chosen candidates, so what were they to do? And they decided they would uh, elect the 77-year-old Cardinal Angelo Roncalli, who was the Patriarch of Venice. Now, Roncalli was by no means uh, a liberal, in the sense we'd say today. He was apostolic delegate to France at the end of World War II, and he defended a lot of the bishops who supported the Vichy regime in France. Uh, the anti-clericals there, they wanted General de Gaulle to dismiss uh, 30 of the bishops. And John, uh, the future John XXIII, Roncalli, he, he persuaded him to reduce the number to three. He dealt ruthlessly with the worker priest movement, which had really become the communist priest movement. And as Patriarch of Venice, when he went there, he really tightened up the discipline in, in Venice. Priests were ordered to wear the soutane. Uh, they were forbidden to go to the theatre. And they weren't to ever to go inside of the Lido in case they saw a lady in a bathing costume. So he was, uh, you know, he's, he's a pretty strict person. Then when he became Pope <clears throat> in 1961, he warned against unorthodox tendencies among some Catholic biblical scholars. And in 1962, he put out a monitor condemning the works of Pierre de Chardin. And his apostolic constitution, Veterum Sapiensae, insisted that Latin should be retained as the language of the Church. But now, of course, he's been allocated a prominent place in the liberal pantheon. Uh, and uh, the, the explanation the liberals give of his apparent conservatism was that he was liberated by the council. Before the council, they said he was almost helplessly at the mercy of his curial advisers. Well, press reports started designating him as a stopgap pope, which in fact he was. He was a stopgap pope. And uh, this upset him, and he decided that he'd make a name for himself in the history of the church by calling a general council. 
uh, he insisted that this decision was inspired by God. Uh, to quote him, we had decided under the inspiration of God to convene an ecumenical council. Uh, where, you, where you talk about an ecumenical council as a general council of the church, it's got nothing to do with ecumenism or the, or the ecumenical movement. There are all sorts of councils, uh, from diocesan, national, patriarchal, but the highest is an ecumenical council from the Greek word uh, ecumenikos, which means the whole world. And there had been 20 of these councils prior to Vatican II, from Nicaea in 325 to Vatican I in 1869. An, an authentic ecumenical council must be presided over by the Pope's legates, and its decrees, if they're confirmed by the Pope, bind all Christians according to the authority bestowed upon these documents by the Pope and the Council Fathers. That is to say, the Council Fathers are the patriarchs, bishops, and superiors of religious orders for men. Wouldn't surprise me if they have another one, that the superiors of religious orders for women will come along. Uh, according to Pope John, the inspiration to call an ecumenical council came to him during a conversation with Cardinal Tardini towards the end of 1958. The Pope asked his Secretary of State what might be done to give the world an example of peace and concord among men and an occasion for new hope, when suddenly there sprang to his lips the words, a council. This, he insisted, was an impulse of divine providence. Pope John revealed this divinely inspired plan to the Sacred College of Cardinals on what he described as that memorable 25th of January 1959, the feast of the conversion of St. Paul, and the meeting was taking place in the Basilica of St. Paul without the walls. This announcement, he, the Pope said, when he announced it, it was completely unexpected by the Cardinals and came to them like a flash of heavenly light, shedding sweetness in eyes and hearts. But actually, far from this being the case, there was a distinct lack of enthusiasm on the part of the cardinals. And when Pope John asked them for their reaction to his inspiration, not even one of them had a single word to say. Uh, he later admitted his disappointment. Humanly speaking, he said, we could have expected that the cardinals, after hearing our allocution, might have crowded round to express approval and good wishes. But uh, later, he put a most fa the most favourable possible interpretation on their failure to reply, and described it as a devout and impressive silence. Uh, <laughs> so, Pope, Pope John... Pope John's belief that his council had been summoned in response to a divine inspiration was shared by his successor, Pope Paul VI, as the Paul made quite clear in his opening address to the second session of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, the Pope said, Oh dear and venerated Pope John, may gratitude and praise be rendered to you for having resolved, doubtless under divine inspiration, to convoke this council in order to open to the Church new horizons, and to tap the fresh spring water of the doctrine and grace of Christ, and let it flow over the earth. There is, of course, no obligation for any Catholic to believe that Pope John's inspiration came from God. There's no doubt that he was a good and holy Pope, who uh, he was declared venerable, uh, as you know, last year, and he'll probably be canonized. And as you all know, being canonized, all it means is you're in heaven. Uh, the, they're sure, sure you're in heaven. Uh, doesn't mean you have to be a great theologian or, or, or anything like that. But, but anyway, th those who are familiar with the lives of the saints, they'll know that very often it is to the most saintly members of the church that Satan addresses his most subtle temptations. Uh, in a pastoral letter addressed to his clergy in 1870, explaining the background of the events of the First Vatican Council, Cardinal Manning quoted with approval the words of Cardinal Pallavicino, who is the great historian of the Council of Trent, that to convoke a general council, except when absolutely demanded by necessity, is to tempt God. The same cardinal noted that each several council was convened to extinguish the chief heresy or to correct the chief evil of the time. There can be no doubt at all that atheistic communism is the chief evil of our own time. But as I'll show you in a subsequent talk, it's an evil which the Council made a particular point of not condemning. Was the Church troubled by any internal crisis? Was it suffering from a decline which required the convening of the world's bishops in Rome to fault a strategy to halt this decline? Far from it. 
Pope John XXIII most certainly did not believe the church to be in any sort of decline when he convoked the council. Indeed, in his apostolic constitution, Humanae Salutis, convoking Vatican II, the Pope made a special point of paying tribute to the vitality of the church as it then existed. The church has, he said, followed step by step the evolution of people, scientific progress and social revolution. It has opposed decisively the materialistic ideologies which deny faith. It has witnessed the rise and growth of the immense energies of the apostolate of prayer, of action in all fields. It has seen the emergence of a clergy constantly better equipped in learning and virtue for its mission, and of a laity which has become ever more conscious of its responsibilities within the bosom of the church, and in a special way of its duty to collaborate with the church hierarchy. To this should be added the immense suffering of entire Christian communities, through which a multitude of admirable bishops, priests and laymen seal their adherence to the faith, bearing persecutions of all kinds and revealing forms of heroism which certainly equal those of the most glorious periods of the Church. In the same apostolic constitution, Pope John pointed out the contrast between a world which reveals a grave state of spiritual poverty and the Church of Christ, which is still so vibrant with vitality. Well, there you are, a church vibrant with vitality. The Pope was evidently unaware of the axiom, if it works, don't fix it. Only seven years later, in 1968, Pope Paul VI would lament the fact that the church was undergoing a process of self-destruction. Who would have believed that a debacle of such proportions could occur in so short a time? Certainly not Pope John XXIII. The Arian and Protestant heresies were gradual processes compared with this decline. Vibrant, the preconciliar church may have been, but danger lurked below the surface. The modernism condemned by St. Pius X had by no means been eradicated completely, but had gone underground. It lived on in some Catholic seminaries and universities. During the pontificate of Pope Pius XII, its proponents tended to meet in secret, and to exchange their theories in typed manuscripts, rather well, type typescripts, I should say, <laughs> rather than publishing them openly. Where they did make their views clear, the Vatican would act. So, just to give one example, as a result of the intervention of the Holy Office, the American Jesuit, John Courtney Murray, was ordered not to continue writing on church and state in 1955. But the extent of liberal inroads into American Catholicism at that time is made clear by the fact that his superior, Father Vincent McCormick, made no secret of his sympathy with Murray. Uh, and he said to him, It seems to me a mistake to wish to carry on with this controverted question under present circumstances, but time will bring changes. Time did indeed bring changes, and what Murray had been forbidden to propagate in 1955 was proclaimed by Vatican II as the teaching of the Church in 1965. The preparation of Pope John's Council was the most thorough in the entire history of general councils. In his book, The Rhine Flows Into the Tiber, Father Ralph Wilkin quotes Monsignor Vincenzo Carboni, who was an official of the General Secretariat of the Second Vatican Council, to the effect that no <coughs> previous council has had a preparation so vast, so diligently carried out, so profound. This preparation had begun on the 17th of May 1959 when Pope John XXIII created a pre-preparatory commission. A vast work of preparation was then initiated involving theologians and hierarchies from throughout the Catholic world. On the 5th of June 1960, Pope John established 12 preparatory commissions with a central preparatory commission to coordinate them. The Pope himself was president of this central committee commission. After two years' work, ending on the eve of the Council with the dissolution of most of these bodies, a total of 75 schemas had been prepared. A schema was a preparatory document which the Fathers would use as a basis for their deliberations on a particular topic, and which, of course, they would be free to amend. Some of these documents were merely chapters of full schemas. Some were later combined with others by the Central Preparatory Commission, and still others were considered too specialised for treatment by the Council, and were referred to the Pontifical Commission for the revision of the Code of Canon Law. In this way, the 75 schemas were reduced ultimately to 20. Archbishop Lefebvre comments, 
Prior to the opening of the Council, I was a member of the Central Preparatory Commission, and for two years, therefore, I attended all the meetings. The task of the Central Commission was to verify and examine all the preparatory schemas which were sent to us by the other commissions. Consequently, I was in a position to know what had been done, what had to be scrutinised, and what had to be presented to the Council. The work was done most conscientiously and with meticulous care. A very fine work had been completed for presentation to the Council. These schemas conformed to the doctrine of the Church, though adapted to the mentality of our generation, adapted after careful thought and with much prudence. On the 13th of July 1962, three months before the opening of the Council, Pope John decreed that the first seven schemas, officially called the first series of schemas of constitutions and decrees should be sent to the council fathers around the world. The first four were dogmatic constitutions, and uh, when you hear the titles, it's enough to send any poor liberal screaming to his psychiatrist just to read the titles. They were called the sources of revelation, preserving pure the deposit of faith, Christian moral order, and chastity, matrimony, the family, and virginity. Uh, the fifth schema came into a very different category. It concerned the liturgy and had been prepared under the close supervision of a certain Father Annibale Bunini, of whom I'll have much more to say in, in, in the fourth of my uh, lectures. His influence on the schema had been so predominant that it was referred to as the Bunini schema. Well, obviously, the first four schemas were anathema to the liberals, and they decided, before the council even opened, that... These, these schemas wouldn't even be discussed, never mind the two years work. They're not even going to be discussed. Most of the Council Fathers arrived in Rome for the opening of the Council in 1962 without any clear idea as to why they were there and without any definite plan as to what they were supposed to achieve. They could well have sung as did the British troops who went to France in 1914. They had a song began, we're here because we're here because we're here. Uh, and uh, looking back, writes John Cardinal Heenan, the Archbishop of Westminster, it's easy to see how psychologically unprepared bishops were for what happened during the first session. Most of us arrived in Rome in October 1962 without any idea of the anti-Italian mood of many Europeans. The conciliar fathers, for the most part, shared Pope John's illusion that the bishops of the world had come together as brothers in Christ for a short convivial meeting. John thought there'd only be one session of the Council. Uh, Cardinal Heenan's book, A Crown of Thorns, is one of the most valuable sources for accurate information on what took place during the Council. It's out of print, but I'm sure you could get it from a, a library. Bishop Lucy of Cork and Ross in Ireland had written that certain hierarchies came to the Council knowing what they wanted and having prepared a way to get it. Others came feeling their way. Prominent among those who knew what they wanted were the German-speaking Dutch and French hierarchies. Xavier Ring, who covered the Council for New Yorker, informs us that before the Council had even been announced, there had been pressure in these countries for a modernization of the way in which the Church faces its internal problems. Some groups, he said, were openly agitating for a reorganization, if not the complete abolition of the Roman Curia. Others wanted changes in the laws and regulations affecting marriage and education, the mass, the sacraments, liturgical ceremonies, the holy office, clerical dress, and what they termed the unseemly pomp of prelatial vestiture, and a redefinition of the rights and prerogatives of bishops and laymen in the church's structure. Why, why they left the priests out of that, I don't know. But... Uh, well, the extent to which these aims have now been achieved is the most evident fact of life in the post-conciliar church. Indeed, the ease with which total victory was achieved surprised even the progressives themselves. Father Wilkin writes, They had come to the first session of the council, hoping that they might win some concessions. They returned home conscious that they had achieved a complete victory, and they were confident that numberless other victories were yet to come. In an address to the United States Bishops' Press Panel at the end of the first session, Hans Kung asserted jubilantly that what had be once been the dream of an avant-garde group in the church had spread and permeated the entire atmosphere of the church due to the council. Cardinal Heenan remarks that, looking back, 
it is quite clear that the English-speaking bishops were quite unprepared for the kind of council that the rest of the Northern Europeans were planning. The Americans were even less prepared than the British. They made no contribution at all to the first session, which was largely a probing battle between the old and new theological ideas. The Cardinal's warlike metaphor is well chosen, for a battle did take place. In a review of one of the first books to appear on the Council, one liberal English father, Abbot Christopher Butler, criticised the book for failing to convey to one who was not present at those fateful debates the passion of the drama that was being enacted in them. Dr. John Moorman, leader of the Anglican delegation, affirms that those in the observer's box were aware that during the Council there was a very real division among the fathers, a deep feeling that two big forces were coming to grips and that this was not just a clash of opinions, but of policies, or even of moralities. The tactics used by the Germans and their allies can best be described by comparing it with the technique which they introduced to military warfare, that of the Blitzkrieg. Time and again they shattered and demoralized their opponents by the efficient use of the pressure group, tablet, uh, pressure group methods used in political takeovers. It's doubtful whether any hierarchy but the German would have had the efficiency the organization and the financial resources necessary to initiate and sustain such a campaign. It's probable that the majority of those who supported the German bishops did so because it seemed to be the fashionable thing to do, because everyone else seemed to be taking this line. There was once a popular song called Everybody is Doing It, and when everybody is doing it, uh, the normal reaction is to do it too. And even those who have been consecrated as bishops remain only too human in many respects, as any church historian will confirm. If a bandwagon rolls along, it takes great strength of character to refrain from leaping upon it. When the vote came round, wrote Archbishop R.J. Dwyer of Portland, Oregon, who was wise after the event, like Sir Joseph Porter, KCB, we always voted at our party's call and we never thought of thinking for ourselves at all. That way, you can save yourself a world of trouble. You all will have recognized the quote from HMS Pinafore. Uh, the business sessions of the council were called general congregations. The first of these took place on the 13th of October 1962. Archbishop Lefebvre writes, The council was under siege by the progressive forces from its very first day. We felt it, we sensed it, and when I say we, I refer to the majority of council fathers at that moment we were convinced that something irregular was happening in the council. Cardinal Heenan adds that the first general congregation had scarcely begun when the northern bishops went into action. Their aim was to obtain control of the ten conciliar commissions which would oversee the working of the council, which would mean virtual control of the council itself. After the mass with which the first general congregation had begun, each of the fathers received three printed booklets. The first contained a list of all the fathers eligible for election to the ten commissions. The second listed those who had taken part in the preparatory commissions. The third contained ten pages, one for each commission. There were sixteen blank spaces on each page for each father to complete with the names of the candidates he thought most suitable for the sixteen elective places on each commission. The commissions would have 24 members in all, an additional eight would be nominated by the Pope. The German bishops realized that if the fathers voted on the basis of a general list containing the names of all the eligible candidates, they would be unlikely to dominate the commissions. They decided it would suit them far better if each hierarchy could put forward a list of candidates from its own ranks for each commission. This would mean that rather than voting for a candidate simply on his individual merits, he would be considered the representative of a hierarchy or group of hierarchies. The Germans were in a position to be the largest bloc and would therefore be able to ensure the election of a substantial number of candidates, not necessarily German-speaking, who are sympathetic to their policies. A meeting was held in the house of Cardinal Frings of Cologne, at which a plan to secure the adoption of this procedure was adopted. It was decided to use a non-German father to put their proposals forward, and Cardinal Leonard, president of the French Episcopal Conference, agreed to do this. Cardinal Heenan describes what happened at the first general congregation after the three booklets had been distributed. Cardinal Leonard, Bishop of Lille, rose to make a speech of protest. 
It would, he said, be absurd to vote immediately for members of commissions because as yet the fathers were unacquainted with each other. It would be much wiser and fairer to allow time for bishops to exchange information and discuss the merits of the proposed candidates. If votes were taken at once, bishops would be voting for men with whom they were unfamiliar, even by name. The qualifications and worth of individual bishops are not usually known outside their own country of origin. The cardinal proposed that the various hierarchies should consider the t- what talents they could offer and then pass them on to the other hierarchies. Uh, as soon as the French cardinal sat down, his German friend, Cardinal Frings, rose to second the proposal, which of course was his own proposal. Uh, this drew a sustained burst of applause from the fathers, who evidently thought that the council had been saved from disaster. The enthusiasm of the bishops was unmistakable, and the secretary-general thought it superfluous to put Cardinal Leonard's motion to the vote. The first general congregation of the Second Vatican Council was suspended after exactly 15 minutes. Blitzkrieg tactics indeed. Cardinal Heenan also reveals that in preparing their lists, the bishops from the north acted in concert from the very beginning and were in frequent touch with their English brethren. Henri Fasquet, the religious affairs correspondent of the French Daily Le Monde, describes these events as a demolition exercise by a group of modern-minded bishops. He confirms that it needed only three determined bishops to modify fairly considerably the proceedings of the council. A Dutch bishop called to a friend as he left St. Peter's, that was our first victory. So the spirit in which the liberals had come to the council was clear, the party mentality, the us versus them attitude. Similar comments were made by liberal fathers emerging from St. Peter's after another victory and recounted with great relish and approval by Robert Kaiser, who reported on the council for Time magazine. Now the gloves are off, said one of them, the big fellow whose Cardinal Bayer got him and I got him too. The German bishops had prepared the ground for victory by persuading the council to accept their proposals for electing members to the commissions. But to achieve victory, it was necessary to get their own candidates elected. To continue with the Blitzkrieg analogy, the Stukas had done their work, and now it was time for the Panzers to move in. Then, writes Cardinal Heenan, began the well-known process of lobbying. In his diary for the 13th of October 1962, he records that he received visits from the Bishop of Bruges in Belgium, who came as an emissary from the German bishops. He gave Archbishop Heenan some names that the Germans, Dutch and Belgians intended to back and explained that a final list was being drawn up at a meeting then in progress at the Anima College, the German House of Studies, under the presidency of Cardinal Frings. This list would be available at nine o'clock the next day. Meanwhile, many names had been given, and it was hoped to make the list fairly international. It would attract the votes of missionaries. For example, the Congo had many Belgian bishops. You see, nobody else was preparing lists. These were the only people uh, making them. Archbishop Lefebvre has recorded the stupefaction of the fathers when, on the 14th of October, each one was presented with a printed list of candidates containing names which most of them had never heard of, but for whom they eventually voted. He writes, those who prepared these lists knew these bishops very well. They were, I do not need to tell you, all of the same tendency. Cardinal Heenan tells us that, Even using every spare moment, it was impossible to learn enough about 16 people for each of the commissions. It was therefore inevitable that the bishops gave votes for some candidates, knowing little about them beyond their names. Uh, And that, of course, is what the Germans have as their objection. They said, if we vote for the lists that have been prepared uh, before the council, all they would know were the names of the the candidates. Uh, And now that's all they knew then, the names of the candidates. The manoeuvre which resulted in the liberal takeover of the Ten Commissions uh, is being documented in detail in Father Wilkins' book. He explains how the Rhine group, that's to say the German bishops and their allies, quickly expanded to include the bishops of Austria, Switzerland, Holland, Belgium and France. A Dutch-born bishop of an African diocese was instrumental in organising a list of bishops from both French and English-speaking Africa, which he put at the disposal of the Rhine, Rhine group thus assuring it of many extra votes. Liberal-minded bishops from other countries were contacted, both as candidates and supporters, and a hand-picked list of 109 candidates was drawn up to ensure Rhine Group representation on all the commissions. And, in a success which exceeded anything they had thought possible, 79 of the 109 candidates were elected. 
And when the Pope in, appointed his own nominees to bring the number of each commission up to 24, he included eight more Rhine candidates. So eight out of every ten candidates put forward by the European Alliance, as the Rhine group was, was now being called, received a seat on the commission. After this election, writes Father Wilkin, it was not too hard to foresee which group was well enough organized to take over the leadership of the Second Vatican Council. The Rhine had begun to flow into the Tiber. This success had been achieved because in contrast with other hierarchies, the, the alliance was able to operate effectively because he, he, he knew what it wanted and what it did not want. Not by the common how communists used to take over you know, big companies. In England, the Ford Motor Company, they had something like 20,000 workers and about 150 communists, and they controlled every committee. When you're having an election, well, to start with, about 9 out of 10 of the workers didn't turn up, and someone would get up and say, I propose so-and-so, someone would say, I second that, and then nearly every, everyone would vote, vote for them. Uh, that, that's in, in any type of organization, uh, in, in a commercial company of that, if, if, if you've got a plan and everything's all worked out before, you'll almost certainly succeed uh, with it. Now I want to say a word about the Pariti. A Pariti, the pearl being Pariti, means an expert advisor. Every bishop present at the council brought his own Paritas. Douglas Woodruff, who was one of England's outstanding scholars at the time of the council, remarks, in this, in a sense, this council had been the council of the Pariti, silent in the aula, but so effective in the commissions and at bishops' ears. Uh, by silent in the aula, he meant that these experts could not speak during the formal sessions of the council in St. Peter's Basilica, but they certainly had no qualms about making themselves heard during private meetings of the commission. Carlo Heenan mentions one such meeting in which the only discord came from the Pariti in attendance. A German theologian addressed us in a voice frequently rising to a scream. The Pariti would advise and in effect instruct their bishops on, on how they should vote. And Woodruff's comment is exceptionally perceptive and it would be very hard to improve on the Council of the Pariti for a one-phrase description of Vatican II. Father Wilkin explains in his book how just one Pretus could impose his views on the whole council if he could win the approval of the German bishops. I'll be giving you a couple of examples of that uh, in, in some of these talks. Uh, bishop Lucy of Cork and Ross in Ireland insisted that the Pariti were more powerful than most bishops, even though they had no vote, because, he said, they had the ear of a cardinal or the head of a national group of bishops, and they were influential in the drafting of council documents. The expert, said the bishop, is the person with power. Carnot Heenan reveals that there were occasions on which the fathers were so overwhelmed with material to read concerning the drafts for conciliar documents, and particularly with amendments to them which could run into hundreds of pages, that they were called upon to cast their votes before they could possibly have studied the text and context much less the implications of the amendments. They were only too pleased, the Cardinal says, to rely on the expert advice that they received from the Pariti. Pariti power cannot be illustrated better than by referring to the fate of the preparatory schemas, which I've mentioned to you as the fruit of two years' intensive study, a preparation unparalleled for any previous council. After these two years of conscientious work, what actually happened at the council seems almost incredible. The Dutch hierarchy issued a commentary on the schemas, which was printed in Latin, French and English, and was distributed to the fathers from all countries as they arrived at the council. This commentary contained a strong attack on the first four schemas, and suggested that they should be rewritten completely, and that the liberal-inspired liturgy schema should be first on the agenda. And as I've already explained, most of the fathers had arrived in Rome with no preconceived ideas, and thus they were liable to accept well-argued policies presented to them by those who already had different aims and definite plans to implement them. So a majority of the bishops voted in favour of these demands. That, that's to just throw out these uh, schemas that have been prepared over such a long time. But it so happened that a majority vote wasn't good enough. Uh, I'll quote Monsignor Lefebvre again, he says, In the rules governing the council, it had been laid down that there must be a two-thirds majority vote against if a preparatory schema was to be rejected. 
In the sixth or seventh sitting of the council, a vote was taken as to whether the preparatory schema should be accepted for discussion or not. A two-thirds majority against was necessary to reject them. In fact, 60% voted against and 40% for keeping them. Since this was not the two-thirds majority required by the council rules, the scheme should have gone forward for discussion. Unfortunately, it must be admitted that even at this early stage, there already existed a highly organized and powerful organization, which had been formed by the bishops of the diocese bordering the Rhine. Their secretariat was also most efficient. This organization brought pressure to bear upon Pope John, saying, it is inadmissible that you should insist on our discussing schemas which have not been passed by majority vote. They must be rejected. The Pope then let it know that since these schemas were not acceptable to even half the members of the Assembly, they must be withdrawn. So the Pope overruled the rules of the Council. Once again, the Liberals had known what they wanted and how to obtain it. And the Conservative Fathers had about as much chance of stopping them as did the Polish cavalry who drew their sabres and charged the German panzers in 1939. And the result? The Liberal-inspired liturgy schema was brought forward to be the first on the list for discussion. And as for the schemas condemned by the Dutch bishops, Monsignor Lefebvre writes, a fortnight after the opening of the council, not a single one of these carefully prepared schemas remained. Not one. All of them had been discarded thrown into the waste paper basket. There remained nothing, not a single sentence. All had been discarded. Father Wilkin comments that this was the third important victory won by the Rhine group. Although the first two victories, the postponement of elections and the placing of hand-picked candidates on the council commissions, were given extensive coverage, Father Wilkin says that this third victory passed unnoticed. The most astonishing aspect of this scandalous affair, the relegation to the waste paper basket of a preparation so vast, so diligently carried out, so profound, is that it really took place in response to the wishes of a single paritus. Yes, just one expert had had the power to in- influence and secure the rejection of this most meticulous preparation in the history of general councils, the painstaking work of 871 scholars. The commentary which secured the rejection of the preparatory schemas was circulated in the name of the Dutch bishops, but, as Father Wilkin reveals, it was the work of just one man, Father Edward Skinnerbeek's OP, a Belgian-born professor of dogmatics at the Catholic University of Nijmegen, who served as the leading theologian for the Dutch hierarchy. This instance on its own more than substantiates Father Wilkin's assertion con- concerning the power that a single priest could re- yield, wield, sorry. No, they would never yield. However, although most of the council fathers tended to ride the bandwagon, the majority were orthodox and would not have voted for any document containing anything that appeared heretical. The tactic of some priests then was simple. They proposed to insert ambiguous phrases into the conciliar text which they could exploit after the council, provided they could get control of the conciliar of the commissions that were going to be set up after the council to implement the conciliar documents. See, once the bishops went home, there'd be these permanent commissions in in Rome, which which would then interpret the documents and and order what reforms had to be made. Cardinal Heenan was well aware of the manner in which the Pariti could phrase the official text with a view to manipulating them for their own purposes after the council. He writes, There are hundreds of papers in the Vatican archives which presumably will reveal to scholars of the future the proceedings in secret commission meetings. The more significant activities within commissions have not yet been fully revealed. The framing of amendments for the vote of the fathers was the most delicate part of the commission's work. A determined group could wear down opposition and produce a formula patient of both an orthodox and a modernistic interpretation. So this isn't some sort of uh, crazy conspiracy-minded old lady saying this. This is one of the leading fathers in, uh, in, in the whole of the council, Cardinal Heenan. In order to win total control of the council, the Rhine group needed to ensure that the procedural rules were altered. 
These were described in what the pseudonymous uh, Xavier Rin praised as a highly interesting and authoritative critique as demonstrably contrived uh, to assure the domination of the proceedings at all stages. Uh, and uh, the principal complaint of the Liberals, according to Xavier Rin, was that uh, the cardinals presiding over the conciliar commissions had powers that were too fast and ar arbitrary, uh, which uh, was another reflection on the curia. Not enough use was made, said the critique, of the council experts or pariti, who not infrequently found themselves virtually excluded from any participation in the work, which of course is complete nonsense. Uh, but this is in the second session now. Pope Paul then decided he revised the procedural rules on the advice of certain venerable council fathers. The Rhine group demands were largely met, and particularly useful to them was the transfer of a great deal of power to four cardinal moderators, who would be responsible for directing the activities of the council and determining the sequence in which topics would be discussed at the business meetings. Pope Paul's own sympathies were made clear when he accepted well-known liberals to fill three of the four posts, Cardinals Dupfner, Licaro, and Suenins. They were, as Henri Fesque remarks, universally known for their reformist ardor. Father Wilkin points out that as the fourth cardinal, uh, Ag Ag Agagianian, I, I was practicing saying that name, I still can't say it, uh, anyway, Agagianian, he wasn't a very forceful person. Uh, and so the three liberal moderators had, had virtually 100% control. Another procedural change, which was very useful to the Rhine group, made it possible for as few as five members on any commission to substitute another form of any amendment proposed. And, by an interesting coincidence, the Rhine group had a minimum of five members on every commission. It was also made possible for the Pariti to speak in the council debates under certain circumstances. They would no longer be silent in the aula. It was clear at this point, writes Father Wilkin, how the discussions would develop. There would be st a strong German influence which would make itself felt in nearly every council decision and statement of any importance. In every council commission, German and Austrian members and Pariti would be highly articulate in presenting the conclusions reached at Munich and Fulda. With the Munich and Fulda conferences, the drastic changes that Pope Paul had made in the rules of procedure and the promotion of Cardinals Dopfner, Swenins, and Ecaro to the position of moderators ensured domination of the Council by the European Alliance, which is, is the RAN group. And uh, when, when they're referring to these meetings at Munich and Fulda, you see the German bishops would meet and decide everything that was going to happen in the Council uh, before they even turned up. The second session opened on the 29th of September 1963. By mid-November, the Rhine group aimed at nothing less than total control. The European alliance by this time had full control of the council majority and was confident that it could replace all the conservative members on the council commissions if only it were given the opportunity. It wished to impose its own diktat, diktat under the slogan of freeing the council from curial control. So once again, in response to the requests of many council fathers, the Pope agreed to allow additional members to be elected to the commissions, and the Rhine group set about drawing up an unbeatable international list. This work was greatly facilitated since the European alliance had expanded into a world alliance. In point of fact, the, the origins of the world alliance went back to the beginning of the first session, and from that time, it was always under the domination and influence of the European alliance. Father Wilkin writes again, The World Alliance during the first session was an undercover group who met periodically. From the beginning of the second session, when they considered themselves strong enough to act more openly, they held meetings at the Domus Maria each Friday evening and saw their membership expand to 24 bishops and archbishops, who represented approximately 65 Episcopal conferences. Although not juridically organized, the World Alliance was able to determine the policy of the controlling liberal majority. 
The election for the additional commission members took place on the 28th of November and all the candidates selected to office came from the list prepared by the World Alliance, every single one of them. After these elections, comments Father Wilkins, there was no need for anyone to doubt the direction in which the council was headed. The commissions were controlled, according to Archbishop Lefebvre, by a majority of members imbued with an ecumenism which, according to their own admission, was no longer Catholic, but bore an extraordinary resemblance to the modernism condemned by St. Pius X. There is little point in devoting any more time to documenting the manner in which the progressive stranglehold on the council was extended and tightened. Uh, You can read the whole story in Father Wilkins' book. What now needs to be done is to examine the manner in which the liberals used their power, And in order to do this, it's necessary to take another close look at the Pariti, for it was on behalf of these experts that the Rhine group had won its victory. Cardinal Heenan warned of the consequences which would ensure if the Pariti interpreted the council to the world. And this is precisely what happened. The confidence of the liberals that they would dominate the post-conciliar commissions was more than justified. Indeed, the five post conciliar commissions were created as a result of pressure from the Rhine group which feared that the progressive measures adopted by the council might be blocked by conservative forces in Rome once the council fathers had all returned home. The members of these commissions were chosen with the Pope's approval for the most part from the ranks of the council pariti. So when certain conciliar texts are interpreted in a manner which appears to be in direct conflict with Catholic teaching and tradition, the natural reaction is to exclaim that that could not have been intended. As far as the intention of the majority of council fathers is concerned, such a judgment would probably be correct. But as regards the Pariti who drafted the documents, the opposite is true. The best insight into the real views of these experts can be obtained not by reading conservative criticisms of them, but by examining their own activities and their own writings since the Council. It is of very great importance to make a distinction between the teaching of the Second Vatican Council, as contained in its official documents, and satisfactory as these may be in places, and the Council as an event. The effects of the Council derive less from the former, that's the official documents, than from the latter. Not least among the consequences of the Council as an event was that liberal theologians all over the world were brought together in Rome at a very great expense, borne ultimately by the ordinary faithful, where they were able to get to know each other, to organize themselves, and to formulate their policies at great leisure and in very great comfort. An Anglican observer remarked that, If Christian unity were no more than a question of prodigal sons returning to their father's house, many of us would be tempted to go there tomorrow if the standard of living is anything like what we saw. (laughs) Under Pope Pius XII, the liberal theologians had been on the defensive, but now, as a result of the council, the situation had been reversed. Pope John, like Dr. Frankenstein, had brought into existence a creature he could not control. As the council progressed, Pope John grew more and more depressed, writes Cardinal Heenan. Doubtlessly, like Dr. Frankenstein, Pope John did what he did with the best of intentions, but now it is the magisterium which is on the defensive. So many bishops are obsessed by one fear and one fear only, that of appearing reactionary. Once again, Cardinal Heenan has summed up the position perfectly. We bishops, he writes, are exercising the magisterium with an unsure touch. To question brash theological opinion has become increasingly hazardous. No wise bishop courts popularity for its own sake, but if only to preserve his authority with his clergy and people, he wants to eschew the reputation of being reactionary. Unfortunately, if a bishop criticizes dangerous opinions, he is said to be an obscurantist. The magisterium is thought unenlightened whenever it questions novel interpretations of Catholic doctrine. Jesus wept over Jerusalem, says Cardinal Heenan, and John would have wept over Rome if he had foreseen 
what would be done in the name of his counsel. And that, that, that comment by Cardinal Heenan has kind of inspired me uh, to compose a little clarihue during, during the lunch hour. I don't know if you all know what a clarihue is. It's something uh, like a limerick, but there are only four lines, two, two lots of r- two rhyming couplets. Uh, so the little one I, I composed, it said that, goes, Pope John wanted something to do, so he convoked Vatican II. He had the good luck to die, or the result would have made him cry. <laughs> so perhaps some of you would like to, to, to compose some. Uh, anyway, Cardinal Heening continues, After the council, a bitter attack on the Catholic Church was mounted by her own children. The leaders of the attack came from among the Pariti, the shock troops of the liberal forces. And uh, I, I'm going to conclude this first talk. Uh, I'm afraid the second one will probably be a little longer. But uh, by examining the fruits of the council, as you, uh, as you know in Matthew 7, 16 to 19, it says, By their fruits you shall know them. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, and the evil tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can an evil tree bring forth good fruit. Well, I think no rational person can deny that up to the present, Vatican II has, bought, has produced no good fruits. If anyone thinks they have, I'd, I'd like to hear what they are. Once again, I'll, I'll quote Archbishop Lefebvre, who says, The reforms enacted in the name of the council have... Cont- That's quite important, in the name of the council, not the reforms... Uh, you know, required by the council, mandated by the council. The reforms enacted in the name of the council have contributed and are still contributing to the demolition of the church, the ruin of the priesthood, the destruction of the sacrifice and the sacraments, the disappearance of religious life, as well as to the emergence of a naturalist and Tihardian doctrine in universities, seminaries, the religious education of children a teaching born of liberalism and Protestantism, and condemned many times by the solemn magisterium of the Church. Uh, And I don't see how how anyone who looks objectively at the state of the Church in the West, or the First World today, can disagree with this assessment. The answer to this conciliar debacle, well, I think there's only one answer, and it can only be found by the entry of the enemy of man into the Church, an entry which the prince of this world made through the window opened to the world by Pope John. I am certain, and this is an amazing quotation, I am certain, remarked Cardinal Pericle Felici, Secretary General to the Council, that when in the Council I pronounced the ritual words, exe and omne, as everyone out, before each session, everyone had to get out who wasn't a, a, a Council father or an observer, which all remember, one who did not obey was the devil. He is always where confusion triumphs to stir it up and take advantage of it. By 1968, that's within three years of the close of the Council, Pope Paul VI had reached the stage of lamenting the fact that the Church, he said, is engaged in a process of self-destruction, autodestruzione. On the feast of St. Peter and Paul in 1972, he went as far as saying that somehow or other, Satan himself had found an opening into the church where he was spreading doubt, disquiet, and dissatisfaction to the extent that any profane prophet giving vent to his views in a newspaper is listened to with greater care than the church. Uh, he, he continued this, his lamentation as follows. We thought that after the council there would be a day of sunshine for the history of the church. Instead, we found new storms. There is uncertainty. People seek to open gulfs rather than to bridge them. How did this happen? We will confide this thought to you, that there was an adverse power, the devil, whom the gospel calls the mysterious enemy of man, something preternatural, which came to suffocate the fruits of the Vatican Council. This judgment by the Pope provides a striking justification for an assessment made by Professor James Hitchcock in 1971. This is what Professor Hitchcock says. There are many curiosities in the history of the Church in the post-conciliar years, and not the least is the fact that so few progressives have noticed the extent 
to which the reactionaries' predictions prior to the Council have been proven correct, and that their own expectations have been contradicted. They continue to treat the Conservatives as ignorant, prejudiced, and out of touch with reality. Uh, which is the same, uh, what's that, uh, 30 years later, <laughs> we're still uh, considered to be ignorant and out of touch with reality. Yet, continues Professor Hitchcock, yet the progressive's hope for renewal now seems largely chimeric. A grandiose expectation, an attractive theory, but one which failed of achievement. In the heady days of the council, it was common to hear predictions that the conciliar reforms would lead to a massive resurgence of the flagging Catholic spirit. Laymen would be stirred from their apathy and alienation and would join enthusiastically in apostolic projects. Liturgy and theology, having been brought to life and made relevant, would be constant sources of inspiration to the faithful. The religious orders reformed to bring them into line with modernity would find themselves overwhelmed with candidates who are generous and enthusiastic. The church would find the number of converts increasing dramatically as it cast off its moribund visage, and indeed would come to be respected and influential in worldly circles as it had not been for centuries. In virtually every case, as Professor Hitchcock, the precise opposite of these predictions has come to pass. In terms of the all-pervading spiritual revival which was expected to take place, renewal has obviously been a failure. Little in the church today seems entirely healthy or promising. Everything seems vaguely sick and vaguely hollow. It's certainly no exaggeration to claim that the present trend in the West is towards universal apostasy. Two American sociologists uh, you, who you have heard of, Father Andrew Greeley and William McCready, who are both liberals, claimed that as early as 1972, the results of a survey on Catholic life in the United States made it clear that American Catholicism, as it was known before 1960, seems to be finished. They found that the decline in mass attendance had reached catastrophic proportions and could think of no other time in the course of human history when so many people, particularly older people, had so decisively removed themselves from canonically required ecclesiastical practices. In questions of doctrine and morality, they found that Protestants and Catholics are becoming virtually indistinguishable, and that the prospects of a significant proportion of the young continuing to regard themselves as Catholics are remote in the extreme. The remarkable thing, they continued, the remarkable thing is that no outside foe destroyed us, we destroyed ourselves. The pattern described by these sociologists is common in varying degrees to most Western countries. A spokesman for the French hierarchy lamented the fact that France is being swept by a tidal wave of unbelief. Cardinal Marty conceded that in the years following the Council, up to 1975, mass attendance in the Paris churches of Paris had declined by the staggering figure of 54%. The decline in vocations in France had become even more serious, the number of men studying for the priesthood having dropped by 83% between 1963 and 1973, and this decline is common to all first world countries. The official 1998 Catholic Directory for the United States reveals that the number of seminarians is now, in the entire country, is now only 1,700, which is a decline of almost 97% from the 1965 figure of 48,000. And that, that's called the renewal of seminary life. So if, if that's renewal, we better pray you don't start having a decline. Right. Uh, And Cardinal Heenan, again, he said in 1972, one does not need to be a prophet to realize that without a dramatic reversal of the present trend, there will be no future for the church in English-speaking countries. Cardinal Paul Poupar, who is the president of the Pontifical Council for Culture, uh, stated bluntly in January 2000, the de-Christianization of Europe is a reality. Cardinal Daniels of Brussels, in an interview given in England in May last year, warned that the church in Europe, he said, is facing extinction. 
During the Synod of European Bishops in October 1999, Monsignor Fernando Sebastian Aguilar, who was the Archbishop of Pamplona, gave the following gloomy but realistic assessment of Spanish Catholicism. I think this applies to most European countries, or to all of them. For 40 or 50 years, Spanish society has moved far away from the Church and the explicit acknowledgement of the treasures of the Kingdom of God. Cultural and spiritual secularization has affected many members of the church. The result of this has been the weakening of the faith and faith in divine revelation, the theoretical and practical questioning of Christian moral teaching, the massive abandonment of attending Sunday Mass, the non-acceptance of the magisterium of the church and those points that do not coincide with the trends of the dominant culture, The cultural convictions on which social life in Spain is based today are undermined and are more atheistic than Christian. In his opening speech of the Council, Pope John had used stern words towards those whom he designated as prophets of gloom who are always forecasting disaster. He claimed that the ashes of St. Peter and his other holy predecessors thrilled in mystic exultation at his Council, which now beginning rises in the church like daybreak, a forerunner of most splendid light. It is now only dawn. But, as Professor Hitchcock has shown, the predictions of the reactionaries, uh, Pope John's prophets of gloom, have been proven to be correct. Uh, And Professor Hitchcock isn't alone in this judgment. Professor Louis Bouillet is one of the most distinguished Catholic scholars of the second half of the last century, keep trying to mean to say this century, but it's the last century though, isn't it? He was a prominent figure in the liturgical movement and it's expected great things from the council, especially from the liturgy constitution, as his book The Liturgy Revived makes clear. He was very swiftly disillusioned and in 1968 he wrote, unless we are blind, we must even state bluntly that what we see looks less like the hope for regeneration of Catholicism that is accelerated decomposition. In his opening speech to the Council, Pope John had explained that the greatest concern of the Ecumenical Council is this, that the sacred deposit of Christian doctrine should be guarded and taught without any attenuation or distortion, which, throughout 20 centuries, notwithstanding difficulties and contrast, has become the common patrimony of men. It is a patrimony not well received by all, but always a rich treasure available to men of good will. There's no reason to suppose that he was, wasn't totally sincere in this aim. Uh, I often wonder, wrote Cardinal Heenan in 1968, what Pope John would have thought had he, he been able to foresee that his council would provide an excuse for rejecting so much of the Catholic doctrine which he so wholeheartedly accepted. Pope John had hoped that as a result of his counsel, the old truths would be expressed in new ways, while preserving their essential meaning, and that this would aid the Church in the mission entrusted to, to her by Christ of evangelizing the world, a world increasingly influenced by secular modes of thought. Uh, as Pope Paul conceded in his opening speech to the 1967 Synod of Bishops, the opposite has happened. We refer to the immense dangers on account of this present age's cast of mind, alienated from religion. They are so full of snares, so that in the very bosom of the church there appear works by several teachers and writers who are trying to express Catholic doctrine in new ways and forms, often desire rather to accommodate the dogmas of faith to the secular modes of thought and expression than be guided by the norms of the teaching authority of the church. And I'll uh, uh, conclude uh, by quoting Cardinal Heenan once more. He he said that Pope John must have thought, uh, uh, originally thought of his council as a glorified synod of Rome, which would provide the bishops with a chance of reunion in the home of their common father. Pope John saw the council as an Episcopal safari. However, before the end of the first session, says Cardinal Heenan, Pope John must have thought his council less like a safari than a siege. Uh, I'm going to conclude with an assessment of the effects of the council from Cardinal Ratzinger, which he, he wrote in 1984. Certainly, 
the results of Vatican II seem truly opposed to the expectations of everyone, beginning with those of Pope John XXIII and then of Pope Paul VI. Expected was a new Catholic unity, and instead we have been exposed to dissension, which, to use the words of Pope Paul VI, seem to have gone from self-criticism to self-destruction. Expected was a new enthusiasm, and many wound up bored and discouraged. Expected was a great step forward. Instead, we find ourselves faced with a progressive process of decadence, which has developed for the most part under the sign of calling back to the council, and has therefore contributed to discrediting it for many. The net result therefore seems negative. I am repeating here what I said ten years after the conclusion of the work. It is incontrovertible that this period has definitely been unfavorable for the Catholic Church. Second uh, talk I'm giving is called The Prefabricators, and it's going to have a great deal to do with the influence of the press upon the Council. But before I begin, I'd better make a little correction to my uh, last talk. Father Barrero has pointed out to me, I called Pope John the Twenty-Third the Ven Venerable, and he's now blessed. He was beatified last September. And I should have remembered that because I was there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I had my mind on Pius the Ninth the whole of the time. So uh, I'm going to start off before talking about the press and the Second Vatican Council by saying something about the press and the First Vatican Council, which we know a lot about it thanks to Cardinal Henry Manning, and we can draw up a comparison of what can only be described as the unholy parallel between the role played by the press during the First and the Second Vatican Council. This parallel is so close that it can only be concluded that the animating force be put behind the two press campaigns was the same, and, and I, of course, would put it down to the enemy of man. Uh, Cardinal Manning wrote this, A belief had spread itself that the Council would explain away the doctrines of Trent, this is the First Vatican Council, or give them some new or laxer meaning, or throw open some questions supposed to be closed, or come to a compromise or transaction with other religious systems, or at least that it would accommodate the dogmatic stiffness of its traditions to modern thought and modern theology. It is strange that anyone should have forgotten that every general council from Nicaea to Trent, which has touched on the faith, has made new definitions, and that every new definition is a new dogma, and closes what was opened before, and ties up more strictly the doctrines of faith. This belief, the belief that there was going to be an accommodation of modern thought, this belief, however, excited an expectation mixed with hopes that Rome, by becoming comprehensive, might become approachable, or by becoming inconsistent, might become powerless over the reason and will of men. A uh, comment's really highly necessary on the extent to which these expectations were fulfilled as a result of Vatican II. The principal objective of the Vatican I press campaign was to, pre to prevent the definition of papal infallibility. This, of course, was the aim of powerful anti-Catholic forces throughout the world, forces uh, which were largely controlled by the press, even in nominally Catholic countries. And, of course, Masonic influence has always been particularly strong where the press is concerned. And if you know the objectives of Masonry, this is hardly surprising. Once it became known that there were some bishops opposed to the proposed definition, a press campaign was launched in their favour. And the situation here was the opposite of that during Vatican II. During Vatican I, it was those in the minority who were the goodies, and those in the majority who were the baddies. Once the existence of this international opposition at Vatican I, the extent of which was greatly exaggerated actually, became known, uh, Cardinal Manning writes, In a moment, all the world rose up to meet them. Governments, politicians, newspapers, systematical, heretical, infidel, Jewish, revolutionary, as with one unerring instinct united in extolling and setting forth the virtue, learning, science, eloquence, nobleness, heroism of this international opposition, with an, iter an itineration truly Homeric, certain epithets were perpetually linked to certain names. All who were against Rome were written up, all who were for Rome were written down. And he goes on to explain that, by a wonderful disposition of things, for the good, no doubt, of the human race, and above all of the church itself, the council was divided into a majority and a minority, 
and by an even more beneficent and admirable provision, it was so ordered that the theology, philosophy, science, culture, intellectual power, logical acumen, eloquence, candor, nobleness of mind, independence of spirit, courage and elevation of character in the council were all to be found in the minority. The majority was naturally a dead sea of superstition, narrowness, shallowness, ignorance, prejudice, without theology, philosophy, science or eloquence, gathered from the old Catholic countries, bigoted, tyrannical, deaf to reason, with a herd of curial and Italian prelates and mere vicars apostolic. The cardinal presidents were men of imperious and overbearing character who, by violent ringing of bells and intemperate interruptions, cut short the calm and inexorable logic of the minority. But the conduct of the majority was still more overbearing. By violent outcries, menacing gestures and clamorous manifestations round the tribune, they drowned the thrilling eloquence of the minority and compelled unanswerable orators to descend. Cardinal Manning went to great lengths to demythologize the false picture of the council built up by the press. All its allegations, whether generalized or particular, were examined by him and totally refuted. But as I'm going to show, uh, it was the case with the Vatican II, it was the myth that the press built up that has still remained today, the reality in the popular imagination. Uh, and uh, Cotton Manning tells us, someone from England wrote to him and said, what, what must we really believe concerning the council? And he replied, read carefully the correspondence from Rome published in England, Believe the reverse, and you will not be far from the truth. <laughs> she links that with what John was saying. Uh, he noted the manner in which the press campaign designed to undermine the council had clearly been prearranged and was carefully coordinated. He writes, A league of newspapers fed from a common centre diffused hope and confidence in all countries that the science and enlightenment of the minority would save the Catholic Church from the immoderate pretensions of Rome and the superstitious ignorance of the universal episcopate. Uh, the circularization of bishops which took place during Vatican II also had its counterpart in Vatican I. An anonymous document was received by the bishops which appeared simultaneously in French, English, German, Italian and Spanish, elaborately arguing against the opportunists of defining the infallibility of the Roman pontiffs. And Cardinal Manning also remarks on how difficult such a press campaign made it for the council to give its entire attention to the discussion of the important matters in its agenda, a problem which was magnified many times over for the bishops of Vatican II. He writes, It is obvious that for the treatment of such matters as were before the Vatican Council, a complete independence and tranquility of mind were necessary, a thing impossible under the relentless assault of hostile governments and an ubiquitous press with a perpetual harassing of half-informed friends and incessant misrepresentations of enemies. And the secrecy of the council was also violated, just as would be the case during uh, Vatican II. Cardinal Manning writes, uh, the enemies of the church were in intimate and constant communication with those who were in opposition to the council. Many of them obtained every schema as it was distributed to the bishops. It is to re be remembered that this fact proves the violation of the secret imposed on all who were within the council, and in those who had sworn to its observance, it involved perjury. The campaign against the First Vatican Council failed, of course, and it failed because Pope Pius IX would not weaken. He met error with condemnation and replied to uh, any demands to modify or adapt Catholic truth to the spirit of the age by restating it with the firmness and clarity of Trent. And despite the prophecies of her enemies, the de declaration of papal that the declaration of papal infallibility would mark the death blow for the church, she emerged stronger and more vigorous than ever. In my first lecture, I quoted Cardinal Heenan to the effect that most bishops arrived at the council without any clearly formulated views and policies, and were thus ideally placed to be influenced by those who were quite definite about what they wished to achieve. If you had told me two years ago that I would be voting for some of the things I've been voting for this session, I would have told you you were crazy, commented uh, Bishop Joseph J. Mueller of Sioux City in Iowa. Uh, Father Wilkin expressed regret that all the Episcopal Conference didn't work with the same intensity as the Rhine bishops and their supporters. Had they done so, he says, uh, 
the rest of the, the council wouldn't have found it necessary to accept the positions of the World Alliance with so little questioning. It would have then been less one-sided, and its achievements would truly have been the result of a worldwide theological effort. But I think Father Wilkin is rather unrealistic here. The strategy of the Rhine Group was that of a definite party with a definite policy. And, uh, with, and it had a nucleus of a party and a definite policy before the council opened. Without such a nucleus, without such a policy, there was no hope of a viable alternative to the Rhine Group being formed. At a later stage, the International Group of Fathers, of which Monsignor Lefebvre was a leading member, began to offer sufficient opposition to make the Rhine Group anxious. But this didn't happen to the third session when the control of the Rhine group was so absolute that it could not possibly be broken. The fact is that most of the bishops had come to the council not as members of a party, but simply as Catholic bishops. Why they had come to Rome and what they were supposed to do there was something they hoped to discover as the council progressed. The greatest concern of many fathers soon became that of coming to terms with modern man, with the spirit of the age and entering into a dialogue with the world. These, of course, are very nebulous concepts to which uh, it would be hard to attach any concrete meaning. To a very large extent, they are the creations of the press, and insofar as they do have any meaning, it is the meaning that the mass media impart to them. The mass media, the press in particular, played a key role in conjuring up the mood of the council, the so-called spirit of Vatican II, the mood of euphoria in which so many of the bishops were happy to be told what the world expected from them, and happy not to disappoint the world. Many a bishop, Bishop Tracy wrote to his people in Baton Rouge, many a bishop revised the attitudes of a lifetime on certain reforms once he saw the mood and spirit of the council, hence the big votes which were all but unanimous on most points. The French oratorian, Father Louis Bouillet, remarked, I do not know whether, as we are told, the council has freed us from the tyranny of the Roman curia, but what is sure that willy-nilly it has handed us over after having first surrendered itself to the dictatorship of the journalists and particularly the most incompetent and irresponsible among them. When Father Bouillet states that the council surrendered itself to the dictatorship of the journalists, he means in effect to the Rhine Group, for almost every influential journal and journalist supported the Rhine Group programme. Among the best names are John Cogley of Commonweal, Robert Kaiser of Time, Xavier Wren of The New Yorker, Michael Novak, who represented a number of American papers, Father Antoine Wegner of La Croix, and probably the most influential of all, uh, Henri Fesquet of Le Monde. These journalists all expanded their reports on the Council into books, which appeared while the Council was still taking place or shortly afterwards, and thus consolidated uh, for these journalists the myth that they themselves had created. And it's this myth that has become, for most Catholics, the only real council. Uh, I've already uh, mentioned Father Wilk in my last talk, and he, he wasn't in any way conservative or traditionalist. If anything, he was quite liberal. But uh, he was, unlike most of the journalists there, he was totally objective, and he reported what actually took, back, what took place during the council. His book, uh, which you can get from Tan Books, so I'm glad to say, has is, is been described as uh, documenting the unknown council, and because for most people what actually the place of Vatican II is still unknown. Robert Kaiser, who I just mentioned, wrote for Time magazine, concedes that the reporters were almost all on the progressive side, probably because they realized that although Christianity was the same, its message had to be adapted to the progress of history, while the motto of Karl Ottaviani, Semper Idem, always the same, carried to its logical conclusion, would put the Catholic press out of business tomorrow. The basic premise of the modernism that I described to you last year is that the Christian message must be adapted to the progress of history, which is what Robert Kaiser just said. Uh, and the modernist concept accepts the possibility of radical change in the message itself, not just uh, in the way that it's presented, which was what Pope John hoped for in his opening statement. As I'm sure all of you know, the Catholic establishment in the United States is now a very much a progressive establishment. Writing in The Critic, uh, a leading establishment journal, uh, a journalist called John Leo stated quite openly, it is the establishment that decides what Catholics will discuss, not just in establishment journals, but after a time lag in nearly all Catholic journals and discussion groups from coast to coast. The birth control discussion in the United States, for instance, 
was entirely an establishment production. Robert Hoyt, who is editor of the ultra-liberal National Catholic Report, has stated with no little satisfaction, there is a liberal conspiracy, in the sense John, John Courtney Murray used the word of a breathing together, conspiratio. Liberal theologians dominate the public prints, the catechetical training centres, the publishing houses, the professional associations, much of the Catholic bureaucracy. They praise each other's books, award each other contracts, jobs, awards and perquisites. There wasn't anything sinister in all this. It wasn't planned. It just happened. There has never been a council in which slogans played so important a role as during Vatican II. The progressive establishment has now codified these slogans into a complete system of belief, which its members clearly find more satisfying than scripture and tradition as the basis of their faith. The prime tenets of this new creed are to read the signs of the times, to be open, to dialogue, to cater for the needs of contemporary man, and above all, to do everything in the spirit of Vatican II. It hardly needs saying that these slogans do not mean what they might appear to mean on a first reading. In fact, as with a new speak devised by George Orwell in his novel 1984, some of these slogans mean precisely the opposite to what they might seem to convey. For example, to be open and to dialogue means in practice that wherever possible, anyone who deviates from the party line will be prevented from expressing his views in public, or at least in a manner which will enable a large section of the public to learn his views. One of the key slogans which was accepted as an article of faith from the very beginning of the Council was for the news of those in authority to respond to public opinion. A French bishop remarked after the first session, formerly only theologians were interested in considered texts. Today, bishops are faced with a public opinion which looks avidly to the texts coming out of the Council. He adds that this state of affairs was brought about by the public press. The manner in which the public opinion, which the press claims to reflect, is often imposed on the public by the press, is a fact of secular life. Uh, which, I'll, I'll try not to digress on that, but as you know, they're, they're, how, how the grip the press has on, uh, or all the media has on, on, on national life, now in all Western countries, is, is uniform everywhere. Uh, you take the way they develop the acceptance of homosexuality. Uh, you find hardly any major paper now that would dare to, you know, make an attack on, on, on this terrible perversion for what it is. Uh, and uh, in a lot of jobs, you, 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 you lose your job if you express your opinion. And they, they establish a consensus. And uh, you can have discussions, but only within that, it, only within that consensus. And Father Louis Boyer, referring specifically to the Church, says the consensus fidelium is something quite different from a public opinion which is manipulated and even fabricated by a press, which, even when it is not completely led off the track by its pursuit of the sensational, remains hardly or not at all capable of grasping the real import of the questions under consideration or simply their true meaning. So let me stress once again that this public opinion, it does not originate with the public. The public just regurgitates what the prefabricators have convinced it into believing that that is what it thinks. Professor Hitchcock provides considerable documentation in his excellent book, another book you should get, The Decline and Fall of Radical Catholicism, to show the contempt which liberals have for ordinary believers. Uh, they describe them uh, in a he, series of documented quotations which Hitchcock provides as a herd which is straying apathetically behind and is difficult to love. The ordinary believer is a superstitious religious caterpillar. Father Gerard Sloyan, a prominent member of the catechetical establishment, uh, said after the Second Vatican Council uh, about the Catholic laity what the Duke of Wellington said about the British Army. He said, they may not scare the enemy, but by God, they scare me. Uh, <coughs> Father Antoine Regner of La Croix, who, who used to tell the French bishops what to think and what to say, makes the following comments with regard to Archbishop Carley, who was a member of the International Group of Fathers. Yet you mustn't mix up this International Group of Fathers, to which uh, Archbishop of Fevre, uh, uh, Bishop Seni, Bishop Sego from Brazil all belong. That's the International Group of Fathers, and the Rhine Group, or rather the European Alliance or the World Alliance. And this is what uh, uh, this fa Father Wagner wrote in La Croix, which is the official paper of the French bishops. He has often been heard during the first session. His pathetic voice will again often be heard, and his specious arguments in favour of the primacy and against the collegiality of the bishops. 
So the crime of Bishop Carley was, of course, to hold different views from those of Father Wegner. Similarly, Henri Fesquet never had the slightest doubt that his grasp of theology was far more profound than any bishop who had the temerity to depart from the prefabricated consensus which most of the fathers had been conditioned to accept. Throughout his very verbose and very expensive book, Le Journal du Concile, which is uh, over 1,100 pages long, uh, uh, you can see this spirit of Vatican II everywhere. And there is the more than implicit presumption that to deviate by even a hair's breadth from the rigid party line which he adopts denotes intellectual bankruptcy and theological ignorance. As regards the international group of fathers, uh, Henri Fesquet writes, and you see how similar this is to what Cardinal Manning said about the First Vatican Council. For these bishops and for those who think like them, it appears quite obvious that Catholicism is the only true religion. And that the idea of being a Protestant or a Marxist is quite unthinkable. Such attitudes have horrified many who have heard them expressed, but they are indicative of an attitude still widely held in certain countries with a largely Catholic population. They reveal a scarcely credible narrowness of outlook and a total disregard for the most elementary sense of respect for one's neighbour. This sectarianism is totally incompatible with justice and a fortiori the charity demanded by the Gospels. Professor Hitchcock shows that the Liberals' formula for change has been entirely elitist, the imposing of reform from above by an enlightened few. He speaks of the liberal assumption that their own needs, their own sensibilities, their own insights have a priority and superiority which the church must recognize. When progressives, writes Professor Hitchcock, when progressives speak of the church's insensitivity to human needs, they mean exclusively insensitivity to their own needs. Once again, this theory of the duty of the church to adapt to contemporary needs was put forward by the early modernists. St. Pius X draws particular attention to this whole theory of necessities or needs, for beyond all that we have seen it is, as it were, the base and foundation of that famous method which they describe as historical. One of the most pressing of these alleged needs where the liturgy is concerned was that of accommodation to the manners and customs of peoples. Uh, Now, we, we do not expect the secular press to have any sympathy for traditional Catholicism in any of its aspects, but where the reporting of Vatican II was concerned, Father Bouillet reserves particular censure for those so-called Catholic journalists who claimed expert knowledge but seemed tireless, tiresomely inclined to adopt the worst irregularities of their new craft by seeking out the sensational and even the scandalous when they were not imposing their own disreputable points of view with every means, including slander and blackmail. After this, we need not complain if the professional journalists did not do much better. Father Bouillet continues, Since that time, this phenomenon has, not, has only grown and become more complex. Most of the theologians who courted the great press contracted with sometimes caricatural excesses these glaring vices so cheerfully that it makes us wonder about the roots of their attachment to truth. When we see them today in closed ranks, sending thundering condemnations of papal encyclicals to the press before even having had time to read them, in order to get ahead of, and if possible surpass, the daring of the secular or non catholic commentators themselves, we can begin to appreciate the gravity of the evil. The first task of the prefabricators was to concoct a myth which would result in those being conditioned accepting certain basic assumptions. These would trigger off the required reflex when the correct stimulus was applied. Father Bouillet outlines this basic myth as follows. On one side, there were the bad guys, most of whom were Italians with a rare exception of an Irishman or a Spaniard. On the other side, the good guys were all non-Italians with two exceptions. One party included the Ottavianis, the Ruffinis, the Browns, the Heenans, and the other the Frings, the Legers, the Swenins, and the Alfrinks, merely to mention the Porperati. The first group was uniformly rascally, stupid, and niggardly, while the second was equally beyond reproach, bright, and noble. Uh, such a created mythology fittingly bolst uh, bolstered the slogans. On the one side you had tradition, identified as the most desperate obscurantism, while the other party bespoke complete new newness in a noonday light. 
Authority was pictured as against freedom and vice versa. Bishop G.P. Dwyer of Leeds in England, in a review of Robert Kaiser's book, Inside the Council, expressed himself in terms very similar to those of Father Bouye. Like the mountains, like the mountains from across the border, he, Kaiser, always gets his man, and he got him. Karl Artaviani in the Curia. As in a standard TV horse opera, the cast is divided into goodies and baddies. The former very, very good and always larger than life. The latter, the villains of the peace. In contrast with the liberals who are good, tolerant and brilliant, Robert Kaiser continues the curialists not only to be bad, but brainless. The bishops, he writes, were learning too about the intellectual bankruptcy of the curialists in Rome. When they held conferences with integralist theologians, they found them a defensive lot, inclined to rely not on reasoned argument, but on wild charges. It must be presumed that Kaiser had charismatic gifts in order to discover these facts. In contrast with the curialists, theologians such as Hans Kung are theologians on the march, men well equipped with the ideas that dovetail neatly into the needs of pastors around the world. Pope Pius XII's uh, Kaiser was no more than a small town aristocrat who wrote rivers of words, but was simply not listened to with understanding by a church composed of intelligent beings. He is even able to reveal that not all the bishops to whom the encyclicals of Pope Pius were addressed bothered to read them. He makes special mention of the encyclical Humani Generis, which, he assures us, could not have survived the climate of Vatican II. And in this respect, he's certainly correct. But this is a condemnation of Vatican II and not of the encyclical. To this council, Kaiser writes, Humani Generis would have been too juridical, too scholastic, too authoritarian, too negative, too narrow too pessimistic, destructive of theological progress, not ecumenical, not biblical, not patristic. <laughs> How much Kaiser knew about patristics? It would be interesting to, to, to find out. I wonder if he would have even been able to name half a dozen of the fathers. But uh, anyway, uh, the declaration of papal infallibility by Vatican I is described by Kaiser as a heedlessly divisive act, a demonstration of the futility of formalism in the face of the 19th century revolt against authority. To state that the progressive heroes were depicted as larger than life is a considerable understatement. Hamish Fraser noted that the progressive establishment has a particular talent for manufacturing synthetic reputations. Some journalists apparently became so caught up in the myth which they had created that they began to deify their heroes in writing reminiscent of the build-up given to the instant stars of the recording world in pop music journals. A comparatively mild example can be seen in the build-up given by Michael Novak to Cardinal Swenins, the Archbishop of Malines. This is what Novak says. Cardinal Swenins is a strong, direct, business-like man. His influence at the council seemed for a time second only to that of the Pope, so much so that there were those who in the early stages of the last of the session at least were calling the council the first council of Malines. On one occasion, when the Pope was visiting a church in Rome, Cardinal Swain was seen taking the Pope by the arm, moving him here and there, introducing him. The Cardinal is the type of man who controls the situation in which he finds himself. His voice it's emphatic and clear. His ideas are forcefully presented. He seems par excellence, the type of the modern bishop, learned, active, capable, profound. An 18-line description of Cardinal Bayer by Robert Kaiser makes Novak's description of Swenin seem positively reticent. Uh, Kaiser manifests what can only be adoration for this liberal hero. The cardinal has rounded blue eyes, observant, Penetrating, flickering with sudden deep intelligence, a thin, slight, stoop-shouldered frame, bowed but not weighted beneath the burden of thought, and giving the impression of a mind encased in a tenement of clay, bespoke the fire ready to be kindled, the suppleness of restraint, the measured discretion to accept the real, the reserved power to attempt the possible, the air of intellectual dominion and practical practical conviction that the draught of life's potion given to him was to be tasted to its subtlest finest, distilled and distinguished as a fine oblation to the father of all things. Uh, and 
But uh, Michael Novak, he wouldn't allow himself to be outshone by his chum Bob Kaiser. So when Hans Kung spoke in America, Novak had the privilege of sitting at his feet. He recounts the experience as followed. The tension in the hall was electric. It's a, it's a very original <laughs> metaphor, isn't it? The tension in the hall was electric. In his clear, forceful voice, his blonde hair shining in the lights. <laughs> Father Kung brought the strong, careful theology of Europe to American audiences, caught up in the enthusiasm of Pope John's aggiornamento. And Novak reports that Dr. Kung spoke to audiences of up to 8,000, uh, and when he says that they were caught up in the enthusiasm of Pope John's aggiornamento, this can be translated that they were reacting as journalists like Novak had told them to react in response to what journalists like Novak had told them the adjournamento meant. This was only the initial stages of the Kung cult, which the prefabricators were working on. Few of his works had been translated into English at that time, but the readers of liberal journals were told that he was a great theologian and profound thinker, and they responded with a conditioned reflex of admiration. Kung was the man to hear and the man to quote, so they duly heard, duly heard him and quoted him. Basically, there was not a great deal to choose between the promotion of Hans Kung to middle-class Catholic audiences at that time and that of the Beatles, the teenage market. They were, they were both being promoted uh, consecutively. Robert Kaiser certainly admired Cardinal Suenins as much as Novak did. He says, the Belgian Cardinal is an, is an impressive figure, tall, lean, graying at the temples, his eyes flashing out of deep sockets. Though one of the youngest and newest Cardinals, he already had a reputation as a tiring intellectual, because, of course, Robert Kaiser said in Time magazine, he had a reputation as an intellectual. I'm sure, I'm sure most people agree that most people in the United States, if they read something in Time magazine, they think, well, that, that's it. You know, if it's in Time, it must be correct. Uh, and <laughs> Kaiser, uh, Robert Kaiser, he seems, as I said, he seems to have had kind of charismatic gifts. And... Uh, he, he mentions a speech made by Swenins during the council, during one of the debates, and he says, many were stirred by his words, and those stirred included Pope John. And this is a little strange, because the Pope was in his apartment at the time. But nonetheless, even his most secret thoughts were known to the intrepid correspondent of time. Uh, Robert Kaiser wrote, in his private apartment, John the Twenty-Third sat watching on a closed-circuit television, and he too was stirred. At last, the fathers are beginning to understand what this council is for, he said. Any father who expresses sentiments acceptable to Mr. Kaiser is rewarded with almost superhuman qualities. Uh, Bishop de Smet from Belgium makes a speech in fear of ecumenism, and while doing so, rolls his eyes over the assembly with the pinpointing magnetism of a born orator. The bishop expands the virtues of ecumenism with obviously inspired words. And you might recollect that Cardinal Manning said that, uh, as regards the reporting on Vatican II, all theology, philosophy, science, culture, intellectual power, logical argument, eloquence, candor, nobleness of mind, independence of spirit, courage, and elevation of character in the council were the exclusive prerogative of those fathers of whom the press appear, uh, approved. And if the Cardinal had made a similar study of Vatican II, he would have needed to change one word of this assessment. Monsignor Bandas uh, uh, of St. Paul, Minnesota, said on several occasions that the possible good effects of the council were being sabotaged by misinformation propagated by vast sections of both the secular and religious press. He expressed himself particularly bewildered and saddened by the reports appearing in Time, Newsweek, and The New Yorker. I uh, want to quote Father Louis Bouillet again. If you can get a hold of this book, The Decomposition of Catholicism, you should do so, but it, it would have to be second-hand. Uh, this is what he says. It must be said that whatever respect we may have for our bishops and for the conscientiousness with which they wish to perform their task in the council, many of them were ill-prepared to exercise their role amid the blasts of such a clamorous publicity which was so often motivated by concerns that had very little in common with what they should have been. Under these circumstances, we ought not to be too surprised, especially during the last session of the Council, if many of the Father's interventions and reactions were much more conditioned, doubtlessly without realising it, by a desire to please their new masters in the press. 
A stage was reached eventually when some fathers felt that more could be gained by a statement to the press than a speech in the council hall. Uh, Archbishop T.D. Roberts, who was a Jesuit, uh, a very progressive English father, told a gathering of reporters, I know that if I give my talk to the press, many more will see it and understand it than if I give it in the aula. Cardinal Heenan complained that although secrecy was supposed to be maintained regarding speeches made in the council hall and an oath had been taken to this effect, even during the first session this was often no more than a fiction. The substance, or more often the complete text, was available to enterprising journalists, just as happened with Vatican I. This illustrates the close cooperation which existed between the Liberal Fathers, their Pariti and the press. Twelve hours before the Council Fathers knew whom they had elected to the Conciliar Commission, the complete list had appeared in a secular newspaper. Robert Kaiser tells us that Le Mans reporter Henri Fesque turned in three or four stories a week full of insight and penetration, and he said it's obvious that many of the fathers and theologians were using Le Mans to get the word. In other words, uh, rather than Le Mans reporting what the bishops had said, the bishops were using Le Mans to discover what they were supposed to say. Kaiser's reports for uh, Kaiser's praise for Fesky's reports as being full of insight and penetration is a typical example of the way in which these liberal journalists always used to uh, praise each other. And these men, they certainly constituted the most uninhibited mutual admiration society in journalistic history. Uh, Kaiser tells us that the New Yorkers required reading for the American bishops. That was, of course, Xavier Rin wrote for the New Yorker. And Kaiser was assured by a member of Cardinal Baer's secretariat that the press had a profound influence on the fathers. It was, in fact, one of the factors that helped the fathers to find their collegiality, their sense of universal responsibility for moving the bark of Peter. There was a great deal of informal contact between the liberal journalists, fathers and Pariti. Robert Kaiser and his wife gave regular Sunday evening buffet suppers at which leading representatives of all three groups attended. These suppers were, uh, it, it, well, another of the journalists wrote, these suppers were a small powerhouse of energy and conversation, one of the most successful institutions in Rome. Here, Father Maliki Martin S.J., the thin, wiry Irish scripture scholar, dashed from group to group with his rapid-fire questions and bits of information. Father Francis X. Murphy, CSSR, smoked his pipe in his sly, observant way. A wide spectrum of the world's bishops appeared on alternate Sundays. It is, by the way, highly probable this uh, Father Francis Xavier Murphy was the pseudonymous uh, Xavier Rin. Needless to say, Robert Kaiser was praised by his fellow journalists just as much as he praised them. No one knew more about the council than Robert Kaiser, said Michael Novak. No one had talked with more of its personalities, prominent or minor, or had more sources of information to tap. In the English-speaking world, at least, Perhaps no source was to have quite the catalytic effect as time on opinion outside the council, and this is interesting, and even within it. It is worth noticing, though, how the same conclusions are reached by those with different views. Novak and Father Bouye are both agreed regarding the influence of the press, but differ as to whether the influence is good or bad. Robert Kaiser is also in accord with Father Bouye uh, concerning the extent of press influence, but there is no doubt that he considers it to have been all to the good. One wonders, Kaiser asks, why there should be no outside influence on a council father. Is the authority of the church meant to dominate or serve? If it is to dominate, then there is no need for the bearers of that authority to listen. But if it is to serve, then those bearers of authority have to be attentive to the expressed needs of the world. Kaiser assumes, of course, that the expressed needs of the world correspond with the esoteric preoccupation of his own elitist clique. He goes on to explain that some members of the church are very possibly full of the charismatic influence of the Holy Spirit, and that the only way in which the institutional church, that is the bishops, can learn what the Spirit, who breathes where it wills, wishes them to learn from the, uh, is through the instrumentality of the modern press. Well, that, that's the point of view, I suppose. The theory, you know, the theory that God teaches the bishops through the instrumentality of the liberal press is certainly novel. But the depressing fact is that it was a theory which was accepted wholeheartedly by so many of the bishops who vied with each other in the concern to please their new masters, as Louis Buey expressed it. According to Cardinal Sunins, 2,800 bishops represented the faithful people at the council. 
And it was the faithful people who dictated the 9,000 proposals. The current, the public opinion was growing at all levels. But in order to strengthen the awareness of the people of God and for the Christian to assume his adult responsibilities of the church today, he needs daily enlightenment on events which have to be seen in the light of faith. The Catholic journalist, then, is the theologian of today. Well, once again, one can say that's a point of view. Well, but of course, in, in fact, our Lord actually began the church with a hierarchy, appointed a hierarchy, and then they built up the people of God by teaching and baptizing them. And he also stated that the faithful were to listen to the apostles, and that in listening to them, they were listening to him. Now, according to Cardinal Sunans, the bishops are reduced to the status of delegates of the faithful, whose mind is to be made known through the oracle of the public press. Uh, and uh, uh, one very well-known uh, journalist, the priest, Father Alting von Gezo, he, he said, the essence of our Lord's incarnation was Christ came to communicate with people, and every attempt to impede communication is a sin. Vatican II has shown the Church that she was the people of God before becoming a hierarchy. So I by this, we're supposed to understand that our Lord was the first Christian journalist. And as I've just pointed out, the church actually began with a hierarchy and not, not with the people of God. And as for impeding communication being a sin, one's lost the words of that statement. Uh, uh, as, as Hamish Fraser has said, the uh, real power of the uh, mass media today can, doesn't just consist in spreading false or slandered information, it's suppressing information that they don't want people to know. And they're never more effective when deciding that we won't hear something, that we won't know anything. Uh, but there are only too many council fathers willing to manifest uncritical acceptance of the role which the press claimed for itself and to offer homage to their new mentors. Cardinal Koenig, the Archbishop of Vienna, explains, Public opinion has influenced the council. Public opinion has now taken over the role played by kings and princes in former times. The role of official representatives and ambassadors is now exercised by journalists. When a Catholic journalist has something to say, he need not always wait for the permission of a bishop or information from Rome. He must alert those he considers need to be alerted. He must incite to action those who he considers need to be incited. He must inform the world about the church and the church about the world. He can and must open the mouth and the ears of the church. He must not allow her to remain either deaf or mute. And it's unbelievable, a cardinal. He was talking this out of rubbish. Uh, Monsignor Sturm, who's the Archbishop of Sens and a member of the French Episcopal Committee of the Press for the Council, offered the following obsequious tribute. I must thank you for your fidelity and your elevated standard of professional integrity. Your task is not easy. I know your difficulties. I congratulate you on your magnificent effort. Satisfaction with the quality of your work is expressed on every side. This is all most encouraging for us. Once the Council Father was prepared to accept that public opinion, the voice of the people, was the voice of God, and that the journalists of the establishment press were the inspired and authentic interpreters uh, of this infallible magisterium, then life was made very, uh, very, very easy for him. Uh, I want to mention a bit now about the, the, the so-called Rome-Moscow uh, agreement, which Hamish Fraser was the first person to expose this. And the Vatican considered that persuading Russian Orthodox observers to attend the council was a matter of the very highest priority. Monsignor Willebrand secured something of a diplomatic triumph when, after negotiations in Paris and Moscow, two Russian Orthodox observers arrived at the very last minute, contrary to everyone's expectations. According to the Soviet news agency Novosti, the Russian delegates expressed their satisfaction at the unaffected friendship of the Pope. At that time, uh, as you all know, the administration of the Russian Orthodox Church was strictly under state control. So if observers came to the council, it was because the Soviet government considered that allowing this would advance his political ambitions, and for no other reason. In his celebrated 1972 Lenten letter to the Patriarch Pimen, head of the Orthodox Church, Solzhenitsyn asked, what could one say in favor of a church administration that, it is, that is at the mercy of atheistic dictators appointed to control it by the Department for Religious Affairs. 
Peter Nichols, the Roman correspondent of the Times, claimed that during Monsignor Willebrand's Moscow visit, the 27th of September to the 2nd of October 1962, assurances were given that the Council would not breathe a spirit of anti-communism. Henri Fesquet reported that the presence of the Russian observers was explained by the fact that the Kremlin had received the, insurance, the assurances that it had hoped for, les apaisements souhaités. If Monsignor Willebrands did enter into any definite uh, agreement with the Kremlin, that there'd be no, uh, nothing anti-communist would come out of the council, then it means uh, that he had decided for the council what attitude it would adopt vis-a-vis -vis communism. In other words, the council fathers had been deprived of their freedom of action. That this was indeed the case appears more than likely in view of the extraordinary steps that were taken to prevent the council condemning communism. Cardinal Alfrink, uh, the Dutch cardinal, stated more than once that any new condemnation of Marxism or communism must be avoided. And when he spoke, he spoke for the entire Rhine group. In an interview published by Novosti, the Soviet news agency, Archpriest Vitaly Boroyev and Archimandrite uh, Vladimir Kokoyarov praised the Council's favourable and auspicious beginning, as shown by the appeal of the Council Fathers for peace and by Pope John's pronouncement. One of the more sophisticated Soviet papers, the Literary Cassette, sent a special correspondent, M. Kledov, to Rome to cover the Council. He expressed approval of the general trend of the first session. So far, he wrote, the die-hard conservatives have failed to carry the day. They have not succeeded in their endeavour to turn the Council into a tool of their reactionary propaganda. Pope John XXIII received his warm approval. One must pay tribute, he wrote, to the Pope, who has taken up a realistic position vis-a-vis -vis some of the burning topics of the day. New tendencies have come to the fore in Vatican policy since the beginning of his pontificate. It is characteristic of the Pope's messages and encyclicals that they no longer contain any overt, furious condemnations of communism, any expression of unconditional support of NATO, any appeals to Western powers to pursue a hard policy towards the socialist countries, but Mr. Gredov is not completely satisfied. There are quite a few Catholic leaders who are still unwilling to give up their anti-Soviet and anti-communist dogmas. They are headed by Cardinal Ottaviani and his ilk. Cardinal Ottaviani had made his own views clear in 1960 in a speech which was seen at the time as an explicit criticism of the projected visit of the Italian president to Russia and has since been interpreted as an implicit criticism of Pope John's new attitude to communism. This is what the Cardinal said. In the 20th century, it is still necessary to deplore genocide, mass deportations, slaughters like Katyn Wood, and massacres like Budapest. But some still stretch out their hands to the new Antichrist, and even race to see who can first shake hands with him and exchange sweet smiles. Can a Christian confronted by one who massacres Christians and insults God smile and flatter? Can a Christian opt for an alliance with those who prepare for the coming of Antichrist in countries still free? Can we consider any relaxation of east-west tensions when the face of Christ is once more spat upon, crowned with thorns and slapped? On the 15th of November 1960, Pope John received a birthday greeting from Khrushchev who called him a man of peace. It's hardly necessary to point out that to be praised by a Soviet leader as a man of peace was equivalent to being called a man whose policies are helping the Soviet plan for world domination. Just as Pope John did not live to see the disastrous results of his council, he did not live to witness his more humane brand of communists invading Czechoslovakia in 1968 with as little compunction as Hungary had been invaded in 1956. When it suited the Soviets to dialogue, they dialogued. When it suited them to make war, make war they made war. Uh, but let me stress the fact, and then this I think is very important, that not one of the liberal journalists who express all these high ideals about truth and openness, not one of them you know, some, some made the least complaint about the conditions attached to the presence of the orthodox observers, which definitely curtail the freedom of speech of the Council Fathers. Uh, which these same journalists were pledged to uphold. This blatant display of double standards will appear in more scandalous when I tell you what happened next. There were a good many bishops present during Vatican II who had no illusions about communism and were determined to do all in their power to ensure that it was condemned. Uh, 
In my first lecture, I quoted Cardinal Manning's citation of Cardinal Pallavicino that to convoke a general council except when absolutely demanded by necessity is to tempt God. Communism was certainly the chief evil of our time and was even more so at the time of the council. Archbishop Lefebvre is in no way exaggerating when he writes, this re the refusal by this pastoral council to issue any official condemnation of communism alone suffices to disgrace it for all time, when one thinks of the tens of millions of martyrs, of people having their personalities scientifically destroyed in psychiatric hospitals, serving as guinea pigs for all sorts of experiments. The absence of any specific condemnation of atheistic communism from the documents of the Council demonstrates more clearly than any single factor its almost total lack of relevance to the real world in the second half of the 20th century. It's almost as if the British cabinet had met to consider the problems facing Britain in 1940 and issued a communique in which the fact that we were at war with Hitler wasn't even mentioned. Uh, the manner in which the condemnation of atheistic communism was excluded from the Constitution on the Church and the modern world is the most revealing example of the extent to which the progressives were prepared to go to achieve their ends. Their, atheism was going to be condemned in this document, but they wouldn't use the word Marxism or communism. There had been considerable pressure within the Council for an explicit condemnation of communism. The Rhine Control Commissions which prepared the text would refer only to atheism. Cardinal Vysinski, who had more to fear from speaking out against communism than any of his liberal counterparts in the West, demanded that there should be a schema on communism. He said, if there is one error today which is serious and which endangers the world, it is indeed this one. Another bishop with ample experience of communism in action, Archbishop Paul Yupin of Nanking in China, asked in the name of 70 fathers for a chapter on atheistic communism to be added to the Constitution. He insisted that the Council must not neglect to discuss one of the greatest, most evident and most unfortunate of modern phenomena, particularly in order to meet the expecta expectation of those who groan under the yoke of communism and are forced to endure indescribable sorrows unjustly. During the second session, 200 fathers from 46 countries had demanded a clear refutation of the er errors of Marxism. The most effective force working against the progressives at this time was the International Group of Fathers, led by Archbishop de Ferrer, Archbishop Sego, and Bishop de Castro Mayer. They drew up a petition giving ten reasons why communism should be condemned, and warned that if the Council remained silent on communism, it would be equivalent to disavowing all that had been said and done up to now. The Church had previously condemned communism on 200 occasions. Uh, the Fathers also warned that Unless this omission was rectified, tomorrow the Council will be reproved, and justly so, for its silence on communism, which will be taken as a sign of cowardice and conniving. The International Group of Fathers received strong support, and 450 fathers signed written interventions asking for communism to be treated specifically in the schema on the Church in the Modern World, Gaudium et Spes. On the 13th of November 1965, the Commission responsible for the scheme of this Constitution distributed the revised version of the scheme, which, contrary to the rules of the Council, contained no mention of the 450 interventions and no reference to communism. Bishop Carley sent an official protest to the Council Presidency, quoting the rules of procedure, which stated that all amendments must be printed and communicated to the Council Fathers, so that they can decide by vote whether they wish to omit or reject each one. He quite correctly pointed out that if the commissions, and all the commissions were Rhine Group commissions, were to decide what the Council Fathers could and could not be allowed to vote on, then they, rather than the Fathers, constituted the Council. Cardinal Tisserand had the responsibility of conducting an official investigation. The first excuse given by the Commission was that the interventions had not been handed in within the prescribed time limit. Uh, I can confirm the fact that the amendments on communism did not reach either the members of the commission or the preti who are part of the commission. There is no intrigue here of any sort. This placed the blame upon the international group of fathers for failing to deliver the interventions on time. However, such a move on the part of the commission had been seen by Archbishop Sego and Lefebvre, who had delivered the interventions on, in person on the 9th of October 1965, at noon, within the prescribed time limit. 
This put the, the blame squarely back upon the Commission. Eventually, Archbishop Duran of Toulouse had to apologise and admit that the interventions on communism had indeed reached the offices of our Commission within the proper time, uh, but were not examined, although they should have been, because unintentionally they had not been transmitted to the Commission members. And it was too late then for the text of the Scalia to be changed. Uh, but the Pope did intervene and uh, he added a footnote referring to, uh, to encyclicals condemning communism. So you could say that, you know, at least implicitly, uh, communism is condemned, but it's not condemned anywhere in, in the text. And how many people, how many people ever read, uh, ever read footnotes? And one member of the commission, he, he mentioned, you know, quite smugly, he said, oh, that's not the only intervention we sidetracked in, in, in this way. Uh, so in other words, you know, what Bishop Carly has said was correct. It was the commission rather than the council fathers, in this case, who constituted the council. And the reason, is that, which I've already mentioned, I've gone into such detail concerning this incident, is not for its intrinsic interest, though I think it is very interesting, but it's to demonstrate the complete hypocrisy of all the liberal journalists I've been citing. Cogley, Kaiser, Xavier, Rin, Novak, Gregory, Baum, Henry, Henri Feske, and all. Uh, one can look in vain in, in their books, all of which I've purchased and read, and in not a single instance does the Commission receive even the most gentle rap on the knuckles for its duplicity. To put this matter in its proper perspective, imagine what a furore there would have been, what endless outbursts of shock, indignation and holy wrath there would have been from the secular and religious press had Cardinal Ottaviani deliberately prevented a properly filed amendment from being voted upon, lied about it, been proved to be lying, admitted doing the same thing on other occasions, and insisted that all the fathers had not been given a chance to express their opinion, what he had done is satisfy the council as a whole. The journalists that I've just cited, they devoted entire chapters of, of, of their books and called this the scandal of the, the century. These things, I've lived through them, writes Archbishop Lefebvre. If I tell you about it, it is not to condemn the council. It could have been a magnific magnificent event, but as it turned out, one is bound to say, things took place which never should have been allowed. But you will reply, the council was inspired by the Holy Ghost, not necessarily. A pastoral council, not dogmatic, is a form of teaching which does not of itself involve infallibility. And of course, there are no uh, documents of the Second Vatican Council that have infallible status. There's a lot of infallible teaching in the council, but it's where they repeat a teaching that has already been uh, defined as in, in, infallible. Uh, one of the most poignant uh, moments of the council occurred during the debate on the liturgy constitution. Uh, you, you probably have heard, heard about it. Uh, Cardinal Ottaviani had very, very bad eyesight, and uh, he had to speak without a text. And uh, unlike most of the Council Fathers, he saw a lot of the implicit dangers in the liturgy constitution, and he, he started delivering a warning. He said, are we trying to stir up wonder or perhaps scandal among the Christian people by introducing changes in so venerable a rite that has been approved for so many centuries and is now so familiar? The rite of Holy Mass should not be treated as if it were a piece of cloth to be re refashioned according to the whim of each generation. There was a ten-minute limit on speeches, which was by no means always enforced, but the Cardinal exceeded it and a bell was rung. Engrossed in his speech, he did not hear it and carried on. At a signal from Cardinal Alfrink, a technician switched off the microphone. After confirming the fact by tapping the instrument, Cardinal Ottaviani stumbled back to his seat in humiliation. The most powerful cardinal in the cure had been silenced, and the council fathers clapped with glee. And why not? Cardinal Ottaviani was a bad guy, and Cardinal Alfink was a good guy. Xavier Rin comments, It seems to have caused Ottaviani to feel insulted and to remain away for almost two weeks. In other words, the bad guys are poor losers. Uh, one wonders, you know, what the reaction of Xavier Rin would have been if Cardinal Ottaviani had had Cardinal Alfrink cut off in the middle of his speech. Uh, I even wonder if it was not possible when this poor half-blind old man was stumbled back to his seat, one of the fathers didn't say to him, prophesy unto us, who is it that cut thee off? Uh, and w once again, this wasn't condemned by any of these journalists. They all, they all found it very amusing. Uh, and... <laughs> I just have to read you this before I finish. Uh, I said that these journalists, they were, it must have been the 
biggest mutual admiration society in the history of journalism, and, and they take themselves liberals or take themselves terribly, terribly seriously. Mark, this is something that was utter rubbish I've ever read. And if you don't believe it, I'll, I'll, I'll photocopy Michael Novak's book and show you that he really did write this. Uh, he reports on a long discussion which took place between some American journalists and two of the lay auditors charged with presenting lay opinion at the council. And this is what Novak writes. The group met in a large sitting room and seated themselves on soft divans and chairs. A maid dressed in a pink dress with a tiny white apron wheeled in a cart with espresso, coffee, cigarettes and cigars. The two auditors were eager to learn about the attitudes of laymen in the United States. The Americans tried their best to explain the position of the American church. It's coming out of the ghetto. The desire among the more highly educated Catholics to enter secular organizations and associations rather than Catholic ones. As the evening wore on, the maid brought in a tray of scotch, ice cubes and water. In a mood of relaxation, they couldn't help reflecting on the creativity of this age in the church of history. Here were six men trying to think what the future of the world in which they lived would be like. On one point they all agreed. They wanted to leave as many doors open as possible. Not enough thought had gone into the position of the layman in the world to make it easy. And as yet to see just what a layman is or what he can do. John Cogley, with his unassuming smile and diffident way, began to talk more and more as the evening progressed. At one moment he remarked that he did not like the word, the layman's role. He liked to think of everything that layman did as sacramental. Even, he said, looking around the room in which the men sat, even talking in this room, carrying on this conversation here tonight, I think that it's a holy thing, a good thing. Uh, the only comment I can make on that, you know, I was wondering what the maid would have thought if she could have understood, understood what, what, they were, what they were talking about. Uh, uh, and they, I just we'll, we'll conclude by, it's rather sad, uh, uh, but uh, it will interest you because it's about the United States. Uh, Pius X had, had condemned one of the things about modernism. He, he, he said that... Uh, People who, people who don't want to seem outdated, want to seem modern, want to seem intelligent, uh, instead of uh, condemning modernists, he said they often surrender and give themselves up to modernism. And one of the most depressing results of the council was the manner in which the European liberal Pariti and their allies in the press were able to convert previously conservative theologians and bishops from countries such as the USA by convincing them that the one unprobigable Forgivable sin was not digging the breast with modern thinking, which of course was their thinking, not to read the signs of the times or to cling to outmoded beliefs and attitudes. Listen to Bishop William Adrian of Nashville, Tennessee. As the council developed, some of the originally somnolent American bishops, catching fire from their alert European colleagues, became the able engineers of liberal proposals going beyond the Europeans in their ferocious, vituperative attacks on the Roman Curia. Yet, however brilliant the American preacher may have been, they got their ideas from the European Catholic liberals. And some conservative Americans, following their second-rate Pariti, joined the revolutionary group to bring about whatever their mentors thought best. The European Pariti, who really imposed their theories upon the bishops, were themselves deeply imbued with the errors of Tyardism and situation ethics which errors ultimately destroy all faith and morality and all constituted authority. They make the person the centre and judge of all truth, and morality irrespective of what the church teaches. It is the root of the evil of this disrespect for authority, divine and human. These liberal theologians seized on the council as a means of de-Catholicizing the Catholic Church while pretending only to de-Romanize it. By twisting words and using Protestant terminology and ideas, they succeeded in creating a mess whereby many Catholic priests, religious and laymen, become so confused that they feel alienated from Catholic culture. There's a kind of little footnote to this talk. Uh, I'll just mention that John Cogley, who I've just told you, elevated smoking cigars and drinking whiskey to the level of a sacrament. He not only apostatized before his death in March 1976, but he was actually studying for the minister of the Protestant Episcopalian 
church and he gave the reasons that prompted him to apostatize in a book, A Canterbury Pilgrim, uh, which was a, published in the year he died. As a reporter for the journal Commonweal, no one had been more influential than Cogley in moulding the opinion of American Catholics as to what they should think of the Council and its reforms. Uh, that I'll finish there. We can... Yes. Well, today the talk, <coughs> first talk I'm going to give you today is called Vatican II: The Protestant C- Connection. And when the Pope decided to summon a council. <coughs> He actually sent out this letter. Uh, I'll just read you a few extracts from it. We, on the occasion of the coming council, cannot refrain from addressing our apostolic and paternal words to all who acknowledge the same Jesus Christ as Redeemer and who glory in the Christian name, but who do not profess the true faith of Christ or follow the communion of the Catholic Church. We do this so that in all zeal and charity we may strongly advise, exhort and beseech them to consider seriously and to take heed whether or not they are following the road prescribed by Christ the Lord which leads to eternal salvation. Let each one ponder and meditate carefully about the condition of the various religious groups that disagree among themselves and that are separated from the Catholic Church which without intermission since the time of Christ the Lord and his apostles has always exercised to his legitimate sacred shepherds and still exercises at the present time the divine power transmitted to her by the Lord himself. If he does so, he must easily persuade himself that no single one of these groups, or all of them together, constitute and are in any manner that one Catholic Church which Christ the Lord erected, established and willed, and that these groups can in no way be called members or parts of the same church as long as they are visibly separated from Catholic unity. For groups of this kind lack that living authority established by God, which teaches men about matters of faith and morals, especially, and guides them in all that pertains to eternal salvation. May all those, therefore, who do not hold the unity and truth of the Catholic Church, welcome the occasion of this council in which the Catholic Church to which their ancestors belong, exhibits new proof of her intimate unity and of her impregnable strength. In response to the needs of their hearts, may they also be able to escape from a state in which they cannot be sure of their salvation. And may they not cease to pray fervently to the Lord of mercies that he may tear down the wall of separation, dispel the darkness of errors, and lead them back to the bosom of Holy Mother Church, in which their ancestors possess the salutary passes of life, and in which alone the teaching of Christ Jesus is preserved and transmitted, whole and entire, and the mysteries of heavenly grace are dispensed. I think you'll all agree that's <coughs> pretty impressive, except the date of it was given in Rome and St. Peter's on the 13th day of September 1868. <laughs> 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 uh, yes, it's, it's the people, uh, you know, it was his letter... An apostolic letter, Jan Vos Omnes, which he sent to the Protestants of the world. But uh, I'm afraid nothing like that came out from the Pope before, during or after Vatican II, inviting Protestants to abandon their errors. And the reason is that a key aim of the European avant-garde, probably obsession actually would be a better word than aim, uh, was to replace the true Catholic concept of ecumenism as laid down by Pope Pius IX in that uh, letter I've just read you extracts from Yambos Omnes. They wanted to replace it with a policy of unity at any price. The key country in which you find this avant-garde was of course Germany and a very very well known uh, English Catholic priest, Father Francis Ripley some of you might have heard of, he used to write wonderful booklets for the Catholic Truth Society. He wrote a letter to the tablet and he explained what was going on in Germany he says, the desire now manifest in Germany to present the Catholic mysteries in terms traditionally associated with Protestantism. Many visitors to Germany recently have been shocked by certain elements of the new approach. An eminent Australian asked a parish priest how he encouraged his people to visit the Blessed Sacrament since he had removed it from the high altar to an obscure side chapel. I don't, the priest replied. All who have spoken to me after visits to Germany have been, to express it, very mildly disturbed by what they saw there. As another priest put it, they are talking about sweeping away useless accretions to the liturgy, 
but they are in reality attacking perfectly legitimate developments which have meant much to the piety of the faithful. Pius XII warned against this very thing in media today. Yet another visitor, an American priest, summed up his impression of Catholic scholarship in Germany like this. I guess they're waging a total war against tradition. Nor is this confined to the liturgy, for Father Ripley continues. Some speak of the tragic definition of the assumption which came perilously near to bring, bringing the death blow to the ecumenical movement. Others want us to drop references to, to tradition as a source of revelation. And alongside all this is a calculated refusal to make individual converts on the excuse that conversion work will impede progress towards unity. Again, a practical reversal of the policy of the church since apostolic times. Now, it's very important to notice that Father Ripley wrote this letter in 1962. It wasn't written with the benefit of hindsight. And it is hardly necessary to point out to you the extent to which the situation he reported was found in Germany in 1962 has spread throughout the West since the Council. And practices which the Church previously condemned as aberrations in 1962 are now the norm. Cardinal Heenan of Westminster, England, has explained how completely unaware the British and American bishops were of the extent to which so many of their European counterparts had been infected by what he later termed ecumenia. Cardinal Heenan writes, We did not know what the Dutch were thinking, and were quite unprepared for the later discovery that some Dutch Catholics had made almost a religion of ecumenism. Impatient of any dogmatic differences, they were ready to barter any doctrine in the cause of external unity. When the Secretariat for Christian Unity was first set up, there were not less than four members from Holland. This did not seem significant at the time, because the rest of the church was unaware of the vast religious change in Holland since the war. Uh, I remember John saying to me the other day, he was reading something by, by, by some European theologians, and uh, they said, since Auschwitz, Thomism uh, is completely irrelevant. Everything we did before Auschwitz is now all irrelevant. It means nothing. A good number of the Council Fathers and the Pariti succumbed very quickly to this disease of ecumenia, which could be defined as a state of mind in which the prime criterion for explaining any aspect of church teaching is not whether it is true, but whether it is ecumenical. Those with this ecumenical obsession were sufficiently powerful to adapt the official documents of the Council to this standpoint, sometimes by ambiguity, but more often by a change of emphasis. The true Catholic position can usually be found uh, by those who look hard enough, but is sometimes phrased in such muted tones that Protestant commentators have been able to give a number of the documents a most enthusiastic welcome. Before examining the influence of Protestantism upon the Council, it will be useful to take a look at the nature of contemporary Protestantism. The first and most obvious point to make is that it is not really possible to make any generalized statements about the positive aspects of Protestantism, that is to say, common beliefs and common practices. The history of Protestantism is one of division, fragmentation and conflict, a fragmentation into 70,000 distinct communions, as is normally the case with sects when they, began to sub when they begin to subdivide, their internal disputes become even fiercer than their op opposition to the body from which they have broken away. Calvinism expanded not primarily at the expense of Catholics, but of Lutherans in North Germany, and the name Reformed first came into common use when opposed not to Catholics, but to Lutherans. Before 1570, some stricter Lutherans had even begun to profess that Catholicism was nearer to orthodoxy than Calvinism. The process of Protestant fragmentation doesn't even stop here. For within each Protestant denomination, each individual is his own Pope in the final analysis. The heretical concept of justification by faith alone, devised by Luther, dispensed with the need for any divinely founded church, mediating the grace of God to man, and able to teach with authority. <clears throat> An infallible magisterium was replaced with an infallible book, the Bible. But even an infallible book needs an interpreter. And the inescapable logic of Protestantism is that no individual has the authority to impose his interpretation on anyone else. Father Louis Bouillet recounts that the princess of the Palatinate once described Protestantism to Louis XIV with this formula. 
In our country, everyone makes up his own little religion. Luther replaced the infallible teaching authority of the church by his self-bestowed personal infallibility in interpreting the Bible. In theory, he conceded the right of every believer to do this. In matters of faith, he said, each Christian is for himself Pope and Church. But, in practice, it was Luther's interpretation which must be accepted. He who does not accept my doctrine cannot be saved, for it is God's, not mine. Luther most certainly did not believe in universal freedom of opinion in religious matters. What he demanded was freedom for his own opinions. Those who disagreed with him, whether Catholic or Protestant, were dismissed as pig dogs, dolts, donkeys, fiends from hell. His interpretation of the Bible was the saving truth. All else was lies and delusions. It's hardly surprising that some reformers who disagreed with him remarked sardonically that it was small gain to have got rid of the Pope of Rome if they were to have in his place the Pope of Wittenberg. A logical consequence of Protestantism is that if each believer is free to make his own reason the ultimate arbiter of truth, then Protestantism must inevitably move towards rationalism. Pope St. Pius X warns in his encyclical Pascendi by how many roads modernism leads to atheism. The error of Protestantism, he said, made the first step on this path, that of modernism makes the second, atheism makes the next. The often impressive structures of the major Protestant bodies are in reality no more than facades behind which there exists a series of ill-defined systems undergoing an inexorable process of mutation into rationalism. It is clear that the ecumenical movement as it now exists is based on the completely false premise that organic unity with Protestants can be achieved by ecumenical negotiations. Such a belief is the most illusory form of utopianism imaginable, and unfortunately its most fervent advocate is Pope John Paul II. And let anyone who doubts this just subscribe to the Observatory Romano for a year <coughs> and start reading his allocutions. Uh, the, the more those in authority, try to bring the church closer to Protestantism then, the closer they bring it to religionless Christianity. Uh, to uh, quote Father Bouye again, Catholics today endlessly drag themselves along on their bellies before the more or less cloven hoofs of all the golden calves with which their progress teems. But what is really extraordinary is that, while at their horizons, they do not hear the enormous burst of laughter gradually growing in the world at the spectacle presented by their maniacal servility. Actually, people stopped taking them seriously long ago. But what else would you want them to do at a sudden and unexpected crawling on all fours by people who turn their backs on you for generations, but hold their sides? Yet, there are more sensitive people in the world, and more than Catholics imagine, who are not only not carried away by all this mouldy incense taken from God for the sole benefit of their nostrils, but who find the stench of this abject humility nauseating. Christians of all denominations are now devoting themselves to the construction of an earthly paradise with the zeal that their predecessors displayed in propagating the gospel. And in this endeavor, they are happy to collaborate with men of any belief or none, providing that they accept that all the problems of the world can be solved by a redistribution of wealth and a drastic reduction in the birth rate. When I mentioned earlier that it was not possible to make generalized statements about the common beliefs and common practices of Protestantism, I was not referring simply to the differences between the sects, but to their internal differences. The denomination that has most preoccupied the conciliar popes is Anglicanism. It would be very hard to find any particular doctrine and state that it represents Anglican belief. All that can be done is to state that it represents the belief of some Anglicans. Monsignor Dwyer, the Catholic Bishop of Birmingham, remarked in a speech during the Council debate on ecumenism, It is a great mistake to imagine that Catholic and non-Catholic Christians always, or even usually, are in agreement about fundamental doctrines. In fact, we are very far apart on many matters of faith and morals. For instance, you can never be sure that the non-Catholic with whom you are speaking, even if he is a bishop, believes in the virgin birth of Christ, or his bodily resurrection from the dead. What is more, even our separated brethren who are sound on these matters and really hold the doctrine of the true faith are still unwilling to say that those who deny these fundamental doctrines are denying the Christian faith. Uh, 
more or less what we could say about our own church today, and, 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 and unfortunately, uh, yes, we, uh, there used to be a time when we, we, we could laugh at Anglicans, but we can't really laugh at them anymore. Uh, now, the, I've got a letter actually from an Anglican bishop which illustrates this, this problem very well. As I'm saying, I'm quite embarrassed reading it out, and it didn't strike me when I wrote it that you could you know, say this about the Catholic Church today. Some, an Anglican uh, lady wrote to him and asked, what exactly does the Church of England teach about the Eucharist? And this is what the bishop said. Uh, the doctrine of the Church of England on the Holy Communion has been expounded in four or five different ways. The truth of the matter is that the Church of England is not at all anxious to be too explicit. And in this, great wisdom is shown. The Church of England ha- has, has been satisfied to state first that transubstantiation is not true. And secondly, that Christ does give himself as our spiritual food. Further than that, there are no definitions. How can anybody define exactly the way in which Christ comes to his people in Holy Communion? Who knows? This is good. Who knows and who has the right to dogmatize? Well, the reverend gentleman is absolutely correct in this final question. Who within the worldwide Anglican Communion has the right to dogmatize? The answer is no one. Certainly not the so-called Archbishop of Canterbury, who has no more authority within the Church of England than the chairman of a board of directors. The farcical situation within Anglicanism during the 19th century, when hardly any two adjacent pulpits proclaimed the same doctrine, has now passed so far beyond the level of farce that that I can't really find a word to describe it. Now, we all know, of course, that the Anglican clergy do not have valid orders, and hence they don't have a valid Eucharist, but we'll leave that aside for a moment and try to get inside of the minds of thousands of Anglican clergy who imagine that they do have valid orders and can consecrate validly, just as our own priests do. These men also insist that women cannot be ordained, and as women cannot be ordained, the Eucharist celebrated by the Anglican priestesses are invalid. Now, all Anglicans, they're free to believe women have valid orders when they're ordained, or they're free to believe that they don't. And... The priest in one parish thinks you know, his, his lady colleague in the next is just as much a priest as he is, which of course isn't a priest at all. But they, then another priest can believe that this is just a lay woman dressing up in priest vestments, conducting a parody of the Anglican communion service. Yet thousands of such clergy are content to remain Anglicans. There was talk of thousands of them coming to join the Catholic Church in, in England when we, the Church of England stood ordaining women. But it just ended up with a couple dozen. Uh, I had a friend of mine, uh, the historian Hugh Ross Williamson, who himself left the Church of England, and he said the Anglo-Catholics have a perpetually receding crunch point. They say, if this happens, we all go over to Rome. Then they'll find an excuse. And the next thing, if this happens, we'll all go over, o- over to Rome. Uh, so you get Dr. Carey, who's the current layman, styling himself Archbishop of Canterbury. He believes fervently in the validity of female ordination, just as, of course, as he believes in the validity of his own illusory ordination. And he considers anyone who says women can't be ordained as a heretic. But, you see, here's this farcical situation. No Anglican is obliged to accept Dr. Carey's opinion. And the Anglicans have now, in the latest negotiations with this Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission, they've graciously agreed that in the event of unity between Catholics and Anglicans, the Pope can have the same authority in the new united body that Dr. Carey has in the Anglican Communion, which of course is no authority at all. So I think that's hardly an offer that the Pope can't refuse. There are also uh, very important differences in moral teaching. The Anglican bishops are not opposed to abortion in principle. Some of them think you shouldn't be able to get abortion on demand. Uh, but, but I don't think there's one Anglican bishop who's opposed to abortion on principle. And their attitude to contraception is impossible to reconcile with the official Catholic position. Though, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, unofficially, some Catholic bishops and even whole hierarchies have adopted the Anglican standpoint in practice. In other words, that everyone has a right to make his own decision. The only Catholic and practical form of ecumenism is to explain the faith courteously and clearly to Protestants as individuals, doing everything possible to clear away any misconceptions without compromising the truth. What the Church teaches is true, and it follows that where Protestants reject Catholic teaching, they are rejecting the truth, however sincere they may be in their beliefs. No one is more injured by the policy of Catholic ecumenists in obscuring the truth to please Protestants than are Protestants themselves. If they are given the impression that one religion is as good as another, 
they're unlikely to abandon their errors and accept the invitation given to them by Pope Pius IX in the Amvos Omnes, which I quoted to you earlier. Any form of ecumenism which does not base itself upon this in- invitation is a betrayal of the Catholic faith. In his encyclical Mortalium Animos, Pope Pius XI issued an identical invitation to that of Pope Pius IX. Let these separated children return to the apostolic see established in the city which the princes of the apostles, Peter and Paul, consecrated with their blood to this see, the root and matrix of the Catholic Church, not indeed with the hope that the, li- the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth, will abandon the integrity of the faith and bear their errors, but to subject themselves to its teaching authority and rule. The 450th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation was celebrated in Wittenberg on the 31st of October 1967. A number of Catholic representatives joined a thousand Protestant delegates from all over the world to pay tribute to Martin Luther. A personal representative of Cardinal Bayer found it difficult to hold a continuous conversation so frequently must he shake another evangelical hand. One of the Lutheran observers at Vatican II, Dr. K. E. Skidsgard, spoke of the manner in which the Second Vatican Council seemed in many ways to have brought the Catholic Church very close to the Protestant churches. Archdeacon Pauli, an Anglican observer, finds that the dialogue envisaged by the decree on ecumenism and encouraged by Pope Paul VI has exceeded the wildest hopes entertained for it. He remarks with great satisfaction The true picture of the Council was that it represented a powerful victory of the forces of renewal in the Church of Rome over the conservative immobilism of its central government. Professor George Lindbeck of the Yale Divinity School, another Lutheran observer at the Council, was happy to note that the Council marked the end of the Counter-Reformation and he expressed his satisfaction that the rejection of the proposed schema on the sources of revelation as well as the results of the discussion on the liturgy. Catholic traditionists must concur, however regretfully, that the Council certainly did mark the end of the Counter-Reformation. The Counter-Reformation initiated what is probably the greatest era of true renewal in the history of the Church. Every true renewal has one common characteristic. The emergence of great saints. The Counter-Reformation was replete with such great saints as Pius V, Charles Borromeo, Ignatius Loyola, Francis Borgia, Philip Neri, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, Robert Bellarmine, Peter Canisius, Aloysius Gonzaga, Stanislas Koska, Francis Xavier, Francis of Solano, Vincent de Paul, Peter Claver, John of God, one could go on. But one thing all these things had in common, besides their love of God and their neighbor, was their devotion to the church. For them, it was only in and through the church that they could find God and serve their neighbor. Where are the songs of spring, I where are they, asked the poet Keats. Where, one might ask, are the fruits of Vatican II? Where are the saints of Vatican II? Well, there's Mother Teresa of Calcutta, but uh, she was a saint before Vatican II, not as a result of it. Uh, and uh, I absolutely can't think of any, anyone in the world now you could say is a saint inspired specifically by, by, by the teaching of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, uh, but there are a lot of people who think that this new relationship with Protestants, now they're all good chums, is itself a wonderful fruit of the Council. But others among us would consider the fact that those who reject Catholic truth find the teaching of the Council more satisfactory than any previous presentation of the faith is a cause for serious concern. I think I've said sufficient now to make it clear that mainstream Protestants found the Council very much to their taste. This is hardly surprising in view of the extent to which they influenced its proceedings. That Protestant influence upon the Council would be considerable was made a certainty when the Secretariat for the Promotion of Christian Unity was established on the 5th of June 1960. It is now one of the most powerful forces in the Vatican. Its purpose was to establish relations with Christian bodies outside the unity of the Church and invite them to send representatives to the Council. The very presence of Protestant observers at the Council was bound to have an inhibiting effect upon the debates. No good-mannered host would wish to express opinions which might offend a guest in his house, if he could help doing so. It is obvious that the presence of these Protestant observers, with whom the Council Fathers mixed freely, and with whom many established friendly relations, must certainly have resulted in some fathers 
passing over in silence aspects of the faith which might cause offence to their Protestant guests. Archbishop Lefebvre complained that, thus, on those points of specifically Catholic doctrine, when it's forced to compose schemas which attenuate or even completely banish anything which could displease the Orthodox and, above all, the Protestants. As is so often the case, Monsignor Lefebvre's judgment is confirmed by someone speaking from the opposite standpoint. Dr. Mormon, the leader of the Anglican delegation, noted that the observers were providing a check on what was being said, and I quote him. Every bishop who stood up to speak has known that, in the tribune of St. Long Longinus, was a group of intelligent and critical people, their pencils and biros poised to take down what he said, and possibly use it in evidence against him and his colleagues on some future occasion. Members of the council tended, therefore, to be very sensitive to what the representatives of these other communes were thinking, and did their best to avoid saying anything which was likely to cause offence. If some father found, forgot himself and said things which were bound to cause a flutter in the observer's tribune, he was rebuked sometimes by a later speaker. Protestant influence did not only consist of this inhibiting effect upon what the father said, they were sometimes also able to have their own views put forward in the debates. Dr. Mormon again reveals, although the observers were not allowed to speak in the council, their speeches were sometimes made for them by one or other of the council fathers. So people like Dr. Mormon would write a speech and a Catholic bishop would read it for them. The observers were also able to make their views known in weekly meetings of the Unity Secretariat. Dr. McAfee Brown, an American Protestant observer, testifies that frequent, and listen to this, frequent changes in the wording or the tone of the final documents can be traced to these briefing sessions. Professor o Oscar Kuhlman, uh, a Lutheran delegate, remarked after only six weeks, I am more amazed every morning at the way we really form part of the council. The very close relationship between the observers and the liberal pariti was disclosed by Father Skillerbeeks when he remarked, one is astonished to find oneself more in sympathy with the thinking of the Christian, non-Catholic observers than with the views of one's own brethren on the other side of the dividing line. The accusation of connivance with a Reformation is therefore not without foundation. Well, I think most of us would find that our own bishops would have a lot more sympathy with Protestants than anyone who wanted to have the traditional Mass. However sincere the motives behind this misguided policy of appeasement may be, its fruits are now available for us all to see. Our Lord gave one task and one task only to his church. This was to evangelize the world. Go forth and teach all nations. The most manifest result of the council has been the replacement of evangelization by dialogue. There is now little effort to convert anyone to Catholicism, be they pagans, members of some non-Christian monotheistic religion, Protestants or even Marxists. At every level, from the Vatican to the smallest parish, there is an obsessive preoccupation among the progressive elite to dialogue with anyone and everyone about anything and everything for any length of time. The council was the catalyst which enabled the bishops in a state of euphoria to replace the daunting task of evangelization by endless, fruitless, but very satisfying dialogue. The Catholic Church has not come any nearer to organic unity with any Protestant body than was the case before the Council, and in some instances, such as Anglicanism, any hope of unity that existed before the Council has now vanished following its decision to ordain women. But nonetheless, the dialogue continues with the enthusiastic approbation of the Pope. Before Vatican II, the Church was engaged in evangelization. Now it talks about it. In 1974, the bishops of the world held a synod on this subject. Their meeting produced a plethora of words, but it is extremely unlikely that a single soul was won from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light as a result of their very tedious and very expensive deliberations. Much of what they said was printed and distributed at every level throughout the Church, so that the faithful could discuss the discussions of their bishops, while throughout the world millions of the faithful abandon the church each year, often as a result of evangelization by Protestant missionaries. I've, I've been told that in the United States since Vatican II, something like 7 million Hispanics 
for being converted to Protestant sects. I hope that's a very, very great exaggeration. But certainly, I've noticed whenever I've been in the United States, you see little Hispanic chapels. In Brazil, which has the world's largest Catholic population, there are now more worshippers in Protestant chapels each Sunday than there are Catholic masses. In an analysis of the working paper which the bishops of England and Wales were to use as their basis of their contribution to this synod and evangelization, Father Paul Crane, S.J., who used to be editor of Christian Order, uh, wrote this. What amazed me then, as I read and reread my way through this official working paper, was that its author appeared so utterly aware of this essential fact, that the Church is so busy tearing herself to pieces as to make effective evangelization a near impossibility, that her troubles are from within herself, and that she must get herself right, give herself back the truth, before she can give it to others. What is this madness which causes those occupying responsible posts in the church persistently to turn a blind eye to the disease which is gripping its vitals, or vitals? Do they think you can get rid of an illness by ignoring its existence, that fatuous optimism is any kind of substitute for a cowardly unwillingness to face the truth, however unpleasant it may be, evangelization can no more be carried out in these circumstances than you can expect a sick man to get up from his bed and run a hundred yards in record time. The other Jesuits and then they used to say, they used to call him poor old Paul. <laughs> and most of them have got married now, but... The most obvious result of Vatican II is what Father Brian Houghton, I know a lot of Americans have heard of Father Brian Houghton, uh, he, he, he wrote a book, My, My, My Turn Crook. And I remember, and he says, the first, one of the problems is that the first thing they do when someone's made a bishop, he has an operation, and they remove his backbone. <laughs> but, but, he, he said you can now describe the Catholic Church as the talking church. To a very large extent, as I've been saying, her leaders have substituted ecumenism for evangelization as their first priority, particularly in Western countries. And a vast new ecumenical bureaucracy has come into, be, into being. There are countless commissions, conferences, publications and courses concerning ecumenism. Those who immerse themselves in it can make it a full-time occupation without the slightest difficulty. In contrast with the daunting task of evangelization, especially among the de-Christianized masses who form the majority in most Western countries, the effort put into ecumenism is never without the immediate and tangible reward of becoming more and more chummy with Protestant friends. Ecumenists on the Catholic and Protestant sides are infected by an ostrich syndrome. Their endless talks take place with their heads buried deeply in ecumenical sand, which is guaranteed to insulate them from the truth that out in the real world, churches of all denominations are emptying at a terrifying rate, with the exception of the fundamentalist Protestant sects who refuse to take part in the ecumenical movement and are constantly converting you know, millions of members from all the mainstream Christian denominations. It's an inescapable fact in the Western countries that the more progress made by ecumenists, the fewer the number of mainstream Christians offering to worship to God each Sunday. But this causes ecumenists no concern there at all. The justification for and satisfaction in ecumenical activity derives from the very fact that it's taking place. It's a self-perpetuating organism giving the, organized, giving the impression of constant and escalating progress. One conference leads to another. National committees mutate into international committees. There is now an ecumenical jet set with privileged members who meet each other in one exotic setting after another. This is particularly true of the Joint Catholic-Anglican International Committee responsible for the notorious agreed statements on the Eucharist ministry and authority. Uh, Cardinal Heenan wrote this early in 1966. He says, There is a fraternity of international conference speakers who appear on both sides of the Atlantic at meetings of every theological complexion. There is no little danger that the multiplication of conferences will lead to a neglect of pastoral action. If too much time is spent on speculation, there will be less spent in preaching the word of God. That, incidentally, Sir Cardinal Heenan, is one of the dangers of ecumenism. We can become so engrossed in discussing each other's theology that the flocks committed to our care, feeling unwanted, may begin to disperse. 
These were truly prophetic words, and as ecumenical initiatives proliferate, the pace of the dispersal accelerates. Ecumenism, ecumenia, to give it a more accurate name, is truly the sickness of the church today. What might have seemed to have been a digression from the subject of of, of, uh, the Protestant influence on on Vatican II uh, is actually very relevant to the theme of this lecture. No reasonable person could deny, as I've just said, that the disease of ecumenia has spread throughout the entire organism of the mystical body as a direct result of the presence of Protestant observers at the Second Vatican Council, even though the symptoms were there long before, lying dormant, waiting for the right conditions to enable the virus to activate itself and then proliferate. The symptoms of the disease were accurately diagnosed in a series of papal statements from Pascendi Gratis of St. Pius X to Mortalium Animos of Pius XI, to Humani Generis of Pius XII. I expect you've noticed how all the really great popes we've had in the last centuries have always been called pious. Uh, thus, though their influence on the course of the Council and the wording of its documents was considerable, the impact of the Protestant observers was most manifest in setting into motion a movement which no group or individual within the Church seems willing or able to stop. Uh, I was just reading the Observatory Romana a few weeks ago, and there's a huge allocution by uh, Pope John Paul II, who says no one can consider himself a Catholic today unless he's devoted to ecumenism. Uh, in, uh, in ten short years, this is what an Anglican observer, Archdeacon Pauli, wrote in 1974, in ten short years, the Council has taken on the dimension of a world revolution. Archdeacon Pauli finds this a cause for particularly great rejoicing in view of the pessimism felt by Protestant ecumenists during the pontificate of Pius XII. The dogma of the Assumption, and the encyclical Humani Generis in particular, had given rise to great despondency among Protestants. Pauli claims, and I don't think any reasonable person could deny this, that the movement given such impetus by Vatican II in its general trend is irreversible. The most dramatic uh, manifestation for ordinary Catholics is the Protestantization of our liturgy. This too has has won great praise from Protestants. And as is so often the case, Archbishop Lefebvre has assessed the situation perfectly. He says with reference to the changes in the liturgy, all these changes have but one justification, an aberrant, senseless ecumenism that will not attract a single Protestant to the faith, but will cause countless Catholics to lose it, and will instill total confusion in the minds of many more who will no longer know what is true and what is false. Needless to say, we all have a duty to uphold the true Catholic principles of ecumenism as set out in the documents of the three popes I mentioned a few minutes ago. It is dishonest to dissemble, wrote Cardinal Heenan, who insisted that the ultimate object of ecumenism is reunion of all Christians under the Vicar of Christ. The full extent of the debacle of Vatican II lies in the fact that far from thinking of entering Catholic unity, Protestant leaders are now confident that the Catholic Church is coming to accept the basic doctrines of the Reformation. Pastor G. Richard Mollard, uh, who covered Vatican II for the French Protestant journal called Reform, uh, he said, while he regretted that a small number of Catholic bishops still confused truth itself with the teaching of the Catholic Church, he was generally optimistic. He affirmed that any Protestant present at the Council who might have felt tempted to modify any of the major axioms of the Reformation, what he called the Proclamation Majeure, would be lacking in intelligence or deaf or failing to see or hear that for more than two years, and doubtlessly for even longer, so many believing Catholics, priests and laymen had been probing the Scriptures, searching, praying and suffering to arrive at this moment, and by other ways at the point where they too accept these very same axioms. Pastor Richard Mola is like Archdeacon Pauli confident that the process of renovation set in motion by the Council is more or less irreversible, quasi irreversible, he says. The influence exercised upon the Council by Protestants can best be illustrated by examining the evolution of the teaching of Vatican II concerning the Blessed Mother. I have to do this into three headings. One, the separate schema on Our Lady. Two, the title Mediatrix of All Graces. Three, the title Mother of the Church. 
the preparatory commission, about which I told you in my first lecture, decided unanimously to devote a separate schema to the Blessed Virgin Mary. After several changes of title, the schema was eventually called On the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of the Church. And if you think of it from a Protestant standpoint, to call Our Lady the Mother of the Church you know, is, is absolutely horrifying. Uh, Cardinal Ottaviani had hoped that the Council would discuss this short six-page schema before the close of the first session, and the happy result, he believed, would have been that the Council Fathers, with the assistance of Our Lady, would conclude the first session in union and harmony. But the very fact that there was to be a separate schema devoted to Our Lady and the content of the schema aroused the displeasure of Protestants and their Catholic sympathisers. The ecumenically motivated Rhine Group program was clear in its objectives. It was opposed to any separate schema being devoted to Our Lady. It was opposed to the title Mediatrix of All Graces and opposed to the title Mother of the Church. There had been legitimate differences of opinion among Catholic theologians before the Council, not on the fact that Our Lady had cooperated with Our Lord in the economy of salvation, but on the nature and extent of that cooperation. An important school of thought favoured by Pope Pius XII had come to see Our Lady as cooperating in the acquisition of salvation and wished to see the magisterium define her as co-redemptrix and mediatrix of all graces. Another school favoured an approach emphasising her position as a member of the Church, like ourselves, differing from us not in the essence, but in the degree of her perfection. While the former view is incompatible with Protestantism, the latter has distinct ecumenical possibilities. The devotion of a separate schema to Our Lady was seen by Protestants as favouring the former view. Leading German Protestants had made it clear that Catholic teaching on Our Lady was a major impediment to reunion, that a separate schema on her, if approved, would erect a new wall of division, that if the Blessed Virgin Mary was even mentioned, they didn't even want her mentioned actually, but if she was even mentioned, it must be in the schema on the church, and even that the council should actually condemn what they termed the excesses of devotion to the Virgin Mary. They made it known that, if their requests were complied with, they would consider it a most satisfactory ecumenical gesture. The rejection of the plan for a separate schema became the first priority for the fathers in Parigi, who considered the ecumenical aspect of the council as its most important dimension. I mentioned in my first lecture that a single theologian could impose his views on the whole council, providing he could gain the approval of the German bishops. In the case of the separate schema, this is exactly what Karl Rahner did. He claimed that if a schema was accepted as it stood, an imaginable harm would result from the ecumenical point of view. All the success achieved in the field of ecumenism through the Council and in connection with the Council, he said, will be rendered worthless by the retention of the schema as it stands. He asked the Rhine Group bishops to declare openly that they could not accept the schema as it stood. The Rhine Group forces were accordingly deployed and went into action as soon as the topic was raised during the second session. Cardinal Frings felt that it would be most fitting to include everything pertaining to Our Lady in the schema on the Church, as, among other things, such action would do much to foster dialogue with the separated Christians. A Croatian peritus, Father Karolas Balic, was particularly active in combating the Rhine campaign, as were many bishops from the Latin countries. One of the Rhine arguments was that a separate schema would be taken as defining something new, but as a, a Brazilian Servite bishop, Giocondo Grotti, pointed out that there were separate schemas on a good number of topics, but no one claimed that anything new was being defined here. Does ecumenism consist in confessing or hiding the truth, he asked, and he continued, ought the council to explain Catholic doctrine or the doctrine of our separated brethren? Hiding the truth hurts us both, and those separated from us. It hurts us because we appear to be hypocrites. It hurts those separated from us because it makes them appear weak and capable of being offended by the truth. Let the schemas be separated. Let us profess our faith openly. Let us be the teachers we are in the church by teaching with clarity and not hiding what is true. When the vote came round, the Rhine group won by a majority of only 17 votes, which was very, very narrow. Even Xavier Ring accepted that it would be difficult to describe it as a victory for the progressives. 
The Catholic Gazette in England reported that Our Lady was denied a separate schema with the feelings of non-Catholics in mind. A very interesting insight into the liberal mentality is the manner in which Xavier Wren in the New Yorker describes the bishops who supported the unanimous conclusion of the Preparatory uh, Commission that there should be a separate schema. He, He described their efforts as an extraordinary and intensive propaganda barrage on behalf of a separate schema on the Blessed Virgin Mary. But it was, and obviously it was the Rhine group which had behaved in a contentious manner by opposing what the Preparatory Commission had agreed upon. Protestant observers made no no secret of their satisfaction at the relegation of Our Lady to the schema on the church. Dr. McAfee Brown considers it to be an item of ecumenical importance. He explains that, in this way, the separate and independent extension of Marian theology was effectively checked. Dr. Mormon, leader of the Anglican delegation, could not refrain from expressing his relief at the final outcome when he considers that a mere handful of votes would have turned the thing the other way with results which might have proved disastrous. Many of his observers, says Dr. Mormon, wondered if this was a sign that the Holy Spirit was at work. The second heading which I mentioned is the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mediatrix of All Graces. Archdeacon Pauli, uh, who I've quoted several times, he feared that consider teaching on Our Lady, whether in a separate schema or the schema on the church, might be used as a device for getting conciliar approval to one or two doctrines which the Pope had in mind. He continued, One English Roman Catholic bishop, who shall be allowed to remain anonymous, wrote in his diocesan leaflet, It is an open secret that the bishops are assembling with great hopes, of new definitions to supplement the dogmas of the Catholic faith already revealed. It is my personal hope that the Holy Father will see fit to crown our love of our glorious and blessed Mother, Queen of Heaven and Ever-Virgin, with a definition of the dogmas Maria Mediatrix and Maria Fons Gratiae, which has ever been in the prayers and devotions of the faithful. The application of the title Mediatrix to Our Lady is by no means new and can be traced back to the Fathers of the Church. The title is attached to Mary in official church documents, including papal bulls and encyclicals, dating from Ineffabilis of Pope Pius IX in 1854. And it has also been introduced into the liturgy of the church through the feast of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mediatrix of All Graces. Do they still have that feast, Father? Do you know? No? You, you think it doesn't? You have But in the 17th missal, do they have it? No, so that solved that problem there. Uh, and uh, as I was saying, the Protestants, they weren't just opposed to a separate schema, they were uh, very far from pleased with what it contained. And they didn't just want this schema to be relegated as it stood into the uh, schema on the church, but they wanted it considerably modified. Dr. Mormon, the Anglican, wrote, The schema produced in 1962 began well enough with a number of quotations from the Bible, indicating Mary's place and her cooperation in the divine plan. But it began to arouse suspicions in the mind of some of the observers when it began to speak of her as not only mother of Jesus, the one and only divine mediator and redeemer, but also joined with him in carrying out the redemption of the human race. Suspicion grew when it went on to speak of her as administrator and dispenser of heavenly graces, and finally, mediatrix of all graces, nor were they comforted by the appended note which pointed out that these were not new phrases or titles since each of them had appeared in some people pronouncement and that some of the expressions proposed by the maximalists had been deliberately omitted. As for the title of co-redemptrix, the note goes on to say that though used, used by Pope Pius X and Pius XI, it was left out of this schema so as not to offend the separated brethren, that no attempt was made to dissociate the council from this title or to throw any doubts upon his validity. But of course, he, he was, he's not separated with, with all these concessions. Karl Rahner stated, quite correctly, that the acceptance of Our Lady as mediatrix of all graces was not a dogma of the faith, but simply a doctrine commonly held by all Catholics. And that, that's been the case with many doctrines, which are equally true. And Our Lady was immaculately conceived before the, 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 the definition of the Immaculate Conception, the same with the Assumption, the same with papal infallibility. Uh, but but it, he... Carl Wanner was correct, there wasn't a dogma of the faith, and it still isn't. However, such doctrines can eventually be defined as dogmas binding upon the faithful, 
and a doctrine which is held universally, particularly when it is incorporated into the liturgy, may well be proclaimed as a dogma by the Pope. In this matter, however, the Rhine bishops were not as content to follow Rana's advice as they had been in the matter of the separate schema. They were not opposed to retaining the title Mediatrix, although they were against Mediatrix of all graces. Uh, this might surprise you. In, in a written intervention, Cardinal Spellman asked whether such titles used by supreme pontiffs could be passed over simply because they would be rather difficult for Protestants to understand. The task of an ecumenical council is to teach the members of the church rather than those outside it. So that's a very good statement by Cardinal Spellman. A good number of bishops from the Latin countries supported the inclusion of the title Mediatrix, including 82 from Portugal, whose spokesmen feared that its omission would generate scandal among the faithful, since the public was by this time aware that the matter had been discussed in the council hall. Liberal Catholics, such as Cardinal Leger, Dürfner, Bayer and Alfring, led the opposition to its inclusion. Cardinal Sunins differed from the Rhine group on this matter, and criticised the text for minimising the importance of Our Lady, which, he said, is a tendency which today constitutes real danger. This intervention isn't actually surprising, as some people might imagine, because Cardinal Sunins had been noted for his devotion to the Mother of God, and he'd written an excellent book on Our Lady before the Council. If any of you have seen any second-hand shops, these faith and fact books, he wrote the one on Our Lady. It's a beautiful book. For this one brief moment, writes Father Wilkins, Cardinal Sunins had the courage to break away from the party line and speak out his own mind. Eventually, a typical conciliar compromise was reached. The Liberals agreed not to oppose the inclusion of Mediatrix if the Conservatives did not insist on the title Mother of the Church. They, the, uh, and I think that the very idea of making compromises with regard to the honour due to Our Lady is distasteful. The thought of Catholic bishops you know, doing the, things what you call a trade-off or plea bargaining or something, isn't it? In the United States you do these things. But to do this in a general council about Our Lady is very, very distasteful. But at least this was a setback for the extreme Liberals but not too severe a setback, because they had managed to restrict the title to the one word mediatrix, and had managed to exclude the three words of all graces, with, and it was this, these three words which were particularly unacceptable to the Protestants. The title of the schema on Our Lady, which it had been decided should be added to the schema on the church, had been, uh, I mentioned it to you earlier, the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of the Church. Contrary to what had been promised in the debate, the text of the separate schema was not simply transferred to the schema on the church, but, to quote Archbishop Mingo of Monreale in Italy, it had been absolutely and radically mutilated. See, so that, that's the things they do in this negotiation. They said, just, just put it in the church as it stands, nothing will be changed. And then when the document appears, they find it's been absolutely mutilated. Among these mutilations, a Spanish bishop laid special stress on the change of the title to on the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God in the mystery of Christ and the Church. He claimed that the revised text had reduced the doctrine of the Blessed Virgin Mary to the absolute minimum, yet he said it had been stated in the Council Hall at the time of the vote that by inserting a schema on the Virgin Mary into the schema on the Church, no diminution was intended or would be carried out. Cardinal Wyszynski, on behalf of 70 Polish bishops, asked the Pope to proclaim Our Lady Mother of the Church, as did 80 Spanish bishops, who pointed out that the title corresponded with pontifical documents issued by Popes Benedict XIV, John XXIII and Paul VI. They wished to have the title restored to the schema, where it had probably been inserted on the instructions of Pope John himself but had then been removed by the liberal-dominated theological conclusion on its own authority during its mutilation of the separate schema. In the end, as part of the compromise to enable the title Mediatrix to remain, the new title for the schema was accepted, and those who had demanded the inclusion of the title Mother of the Church had to be content with the following passage in Article 53 of the Constitution on the Church. Now, now just listen carefully to this. See, they've got rid of the title Mother of the Church, and this is what they put in. You'll see it's very <laughs> the, 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 the nuance here. Taught by the Holy Spirit, the Catholic Church honours her with filial, filial affection and piety as a most beloved mother. However, the matter did not end here. By this time, although effective control of the Rhine group over the machinery of the Council was almost absolute, organised opposition was beginning to emerge. 
In the third session, this resulted in the emergence of several organized groups, which, although never approaching the numerical strength of the Rhine Group's World Alliance, were able to alert many of the middle of the road fathers as to what was happening, and thus to secure the correction of some of the more glaring deficiencies in the schemas. The schemas were, of course, now drafted by conciliar commissions, which, to all intents and purposes, were Rhine Group commissions. And I mentioned to you, I think, in my first talk, the most infect- effective of these opposition groups was the International Group of Fathers, uh, of which Archbishop Favre and, and, and Archbishop Sego were, were leading members. The International Group of Fathers collected signatures for a petition to the Pope, begging him to proclaim Our Lady as Mother of the Church, just as they had done to try and get a condemnation of communism. Other petitions to the same effect had been received, notably one from all the bishops of Poland, so that's good for Poland there, every one of their bishops. They didn't have one uh, dissenter on this, they all asked for this. And then, to the dismay of the liberals, on Wednesday the 18th of November 1964, Pope Paul VI announced at a public audience, we are happy to announce to you that we shall close this session of the Ecumenical Council by joyfully bestowing upon Our Lady the title due to her, Mother of the Church. The progressives, they had several other reverses in this week, and it's come to be known as the Black Week in their mythology. If you read any of these books by people like Xavier Rin, Novak, Robert Kaiser, you'll all have a chapter or two on the, the Black Week. On Saturday, the 21st of November, on the last day of the session, the Pope stated in his closing address that, at his own desire and response to the wishes of many fathers and suggestions from various parts of the Catholic world, for the glory of the Virgin Mary and for our own consolation, we proclaim the Most Holy Mary as Mother of the Church. And the announcement was actually greeted with a standing ovation, and the Pope was interrupted by applause seven times during his address. He also announced his intention of sending a golden rose to Fatima to entrust to the care of his heavenly mother the entire human family with its problems and worries, with its lawful aspirations and ardent hopes. Father Wilkin considers that this this was a partial reply to the petition from 510 heads of dioceses, archdioceses and patriarchates from 76 countries begging the Pope to consecrate the whole world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary as Our Lady of Fatima had requested. But of course what he did didn't fulfil uh, what Our Lady of Fatima had requested. In the face of opposition from Cardinal Bayer and the bishops of France and Germany, Pope Paul had felt unable to take this step. But in fairness to Pope Paul, we have to say Pius XII uh, failed to uh, do it as well, because he saw the opposition was going to be great, you know, even without any idea of a council in mind. Well, anyway, Pope Paul's action absolutely enraged the liberals. Hans Kung expressed their reaction, and he denounced the promulgation of the misleading title Martyr Ecclesiae against the expressed will of the council majority, which will arouse in non-Catholic Christendom great indignation and grave doubts as to the genuinely ecumenical sympathies of the Pope. Professor Oscar Kuhlman, the leading Lutheran observer, he stated, We cannot pass over in silence the disappointment we experienced at seeing the title Mediatrix given to Mary. The fact that the text on Mary, after so much discussion as to where it should be placed, should have finally become the concluding chapter of the schema on the church, a decision which was intended to weaken Mariology, has in reality made it even stronger, because everything stated about the church culminates, so to speak, in this chapter. Professor Coleman also complained that the many ceremonies which took place honouring Mary during the Council, together with the statements made about her by both Pope John and Pope Paul, meant that Mariology at this council has in general been intensified to a decree which, a degree, not a decree, has been intensified to a degree which is not in keeping with the ecumenical tendencies of Protestantism and with a return to the Bible. Our expectations in this connection have not been fulfilled. What emerges from these facts is that Our Lady seems to have succeeded in turning the tables on the Liberals. The inclusion of the schema on her into the Constitution on the Church had an effect precisely the opposite to what was intended. Her title Mediatrix was included, and the title Mother of the Church was bestowed upon her in a far more solemn and public manner uh, than would have been the case if the Liberals had not made such efforts to eliminate it from the text of the Constitution. So it might seem that what this lecture has shown is the precisely the opposite of what it was intended to show. In other words, the extent of Protestant influence upon the Council. But... This is not the case. 
The fact that the result of this influence turned out differently than intended does not alter the fact that so many of the fathers and their advisers were pre- prepared to go to such lengths to play down or ignore aspects of the faith which they feared would be unpalatable to Protestants. A separate schema on Our Lady was rejected for ecumenical reasons, the title Mother of the Church was excluded from it for ecumenical reasons, and the words of all graces were removed from the title Mediatrix for ecumenical reasons. Dr. Mormon writes, it's In its final form, it was greeted by all but the most Protestant of the observers as a just and unexceptionable statement, which could not reasonably be accused of raising new barriers among the people of God. Certain titles are attributed to the Virgin, advocate, supporter, helper, mediator, but the two expressions most likely to cause offence, co-redemptrix and mediatrix of all graces, were carefully avoided. And Dr. Mormon also considers that the titles which are used are qualified within the Constitution sufficiently to safeguard them from misinterpretation. Dr. McAfee Brown, the American Presbyterian, is pleased to note that the chapter on Mary is deliberately couched in as biblical a framework as possible, replacing the string of papal quotations that had characterized the earlier draft, so that there might be an ecumenical meeting point with Protestants and Orthodox, both of whom affirm the authority of the Bible, but not of papal statements. However, despite its deficiencies, the chapter on Our Lady emerged as a very fine, if far from perfect, exposition of the role of Our Lady in the Church, and every Catholic could learn and benefit from reading it. Uh, Furthermore, in no sense whatsoever have developments in Marian doctrine, which many of the faithful hoped would emerge from the Council, been precluded, although there is little hope of their emergence in the present climate. I expect most of you know there's a huge battle going on now to try and have Our Lady proclaimed as mediatrix of all graces. But sadly, I'm sure the Pope believes in, in that doctrine, but that he, he's so withholding his approval, probably for ecumenical reasons. Uh, the attitude to Our Lady manifested by the Liberals during the Council has come to be the hallmark of those engaged in contemporary ecumenism. When Catholic doctrine is to be explained today, the prime criterion isn't, is this what the Church teaches, but will this offend Protestants? And it would be honest, dishonest to try and gloss over the fact that Pope Paul VI, more than any single individual, must accept responsibility for the disastrous effects of false ecumenism upon the Church. When the then Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. A.M. Ramsey, visited Rome, Paul VI treated him as if he really were an Archbishop, rather than a member of a Protestant sect, which, where its own ordinal, ordinal has been relied upon, has neither priests nor bishops. The Pope presented Dr. Ramsey with his own Episcopal ring, invited this Protestant layman to join him in blessing the crowds in St. Peter's Square, giving a clear impression, not least to Dr. Ramsey himself, that he really was an Archbishop and the Primate of all England and successor to St. Augustine of Canterbury. More seriously, the Pope referred to the Church of England as a sister church, uh, a phrase which has been seized upon joyfully, not simply by Anglicans, but by Catholic ecumeniacs. And this phrase is absolutely indefensible when, uh, when it's applied to Protestants. Uh, the term church it can be used in several different senses. There's the one holy Catholic apostolic church to which we have the good fortune to belong. But it's made up of diocesan churches or dioceses. Every diocese is, is, is a church. Uh, I belong to the church of Southwark, where, where David White's going soon uh, to see the new Globe Theatre. Uh, Southwark is called the other side of the river in London. And, and they were allowed to have plays there, but, but not on, on, on what you call the London side now. So I'm, I'm in the church of Southwark. John Rowe belongs to the Church of New York, and today we're all present in the Church of Brescia. They're all sister churches. And the five great patriarchates have also been referred to as sister churches, but the popes would never accept that all the patriarchs you know, were, were, were of equal status. Uh, I'm pleased to say on the 30th of June last year, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith condemned Catholics who describe the Anglican Communion as a sister church or any other Protestant uh, don- dominations. Which is a very, so bearing in mind, Paul VI said the Church of England was a sister church, and now the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith has condemned anyone who said that. It, it helps us to remember what Dietrich von Hildebrand always insisted upon, which is not every point of view expressed by the Pope is endowed with infallible authority. Uh, well, you know, I'm just coming to the end, I've gone over the time unfortunately, but uh, it can be stopped anywhere. As I said to you, 
In my first talk, Archbishop Lefebvre complained that there were time bombs in the conciliar texts, and by this he meant ambiguous phrases inserted into the documents by the Pariti, the experts, which could be exploded after Vatican II in a manner that the Council Fathers would never have envisioned. Uh, in my first lecture, I quoted Cardinal Heenan's observation that a determined group could wear down opposition and produce a formula patient of both an orthodox and modernistic interpretation. Well, the time available doesn't, just doesn't allow me to go into a number of these time bombs, so I'll just give one example. The, orig the original draft of the dramatic constitution on the church stated that the church existing on earth as a structured society is the Catholic church. This was changed to the church constituted and organized in the world as a, as a society subsists in the Catholic Church. And you see the fact that they change it from is to subsists, that, that, that puts a, a lot more importance upon on this change. If it, it had subsist from the beginning, it wouldn't have been so bad. But they took out is, uh, which was used by Pius XII in, in his encyclical on the mystical body of Christ, and put in subsist. Now what does subsist mean? And why was the change made? Some orthodox commentators, doubtless in all sincerity, claim that is and subsists mean the same thing. So, we're therefore entitled to ask, if they mean the same thing, then why on earth did they change it? Uh, Father Gregory Baum, who was a Jewish convert who eventually left the priest and got married, he interpreted uh, the word subsists in precisely the modernistic aspect which Cardinal Heenan said was possible. Baum, he writes... Instead of simply identifying the Church of Christ with the Catholic Church, the Constitution rather says more carefully that the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church, but at the same time, without losing its historical and incarnational character, transcends it. Uh, and now Anglicans uh, are able to quote Gregory Baum with very great approval, and... Uh, one Anglican observer said the cancers therefore admitted that the Church of Christ is something bigger than the Roman Catholic Church. Now, quite recently the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith has produced an official interpretation of the meaning of subsist within the Constitution which shows that the word can be used in a perfectly orthodox manner. And now that is the official terp interpretation of it and we're bound to accept that interpretation. But Catholic ecumaniacs and Protestants would just ignore this uh, authoritative interpretation of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and the harm done by the substitution of subsist phrase is going to continue. Uh, but there's, I'm finally at the end. Uh, I've mentioned Professor Oscar Coleman several times, and there's no doubt that he was one of the most distinguished scholars, probably the most distinguished scholar among all the Protestant observers at the Council. And he was a man of such stature and integrity that he earned the respect of Catholics of every shade of opinion. And he would be a very, very rash commentator indeed who dismiss his opinion uh, on the significance of the Council text. And once again, it's very interesting to see the manner in which his opinion concurs with that about Archbishop Lefebvre. This is what Professor Coleman says. The definitive texts are, for the most part, compromised texts, texts to compromise. On far too many occasions, they juxtapose opposing viewpoints without establishing any genuine internal link between them. Thus, every affirmation of the power of the bishops is accompanied in a manner which is almost tedious by an insistence upon the authority of the Pope. There is, nonetheless, as the basis of all these documents, an intention of renewal from which reforms can emerge after the Council. This is the reason why, even while accepting that there are, these are compromised texts, I do not share the pessimism of those who subscribe to the slogan that nothing will come out of the council. All the, this, listen to this last sentence. All the texts are formulated in such a manner that no door is closed and that they will not present any future obstacle to discussions among Catholics or dialogue with non-Catholics as was the case with the dogmatic decisions of previous councils. And my very, very last word will be, uh, I'd like to quote Pope Pius XII. Uh, one of the Protestant observers, a Dr. Skysgaard, said, We found ourselves meeting together at the beginning of a road whose end only God knows. The situation which developed during Vatican II and the inevitable consequences for the Church, uh, when the the situa this situation was allowed to develop after the council uh, were foreseen 
and described by Pope Pius XII in his encyclical Humani Generis. This is what Pope Pius XII warned. A policy of appeasement could certainly end in unity, but the world, although the world may indeed be united, it will be united only in a common ruin. Which I think if we look around us, we'll see that Pius XII was right. And I apologise. I'll rush upstairs now and see if I can cut my next talk down a bit to make up for keeping you too long now. <laughs> this second talk uh, I'm giving this one is called the Liturgical, <coughs> Liturgical Revolution. Now, I want to begin it by saying a little about the Mass. And the Mass is at the centre of Catholic life, just as Christ is the central figure in the Christian religion. As well as being a sacrifice, it is the greatest of all the sacraments, as it contains Christ himself. It not only symbolises or represents the passion and death of Christ, but contains it. The Mass is the sacrifice of the cross, a fact which St. Thomas Aquinas illustrates by quoting St. Ambrose. In Christ was offered up a sacrifice capable of giving eternal salvation. What then do we do? Do we not offer it up every day in memory of his death? it would be impossible to write anything that could exaggerate the importance of the Mass. It is at the centre of the Christian life, just as Christ is a central figure in the Christian religion. The pon pontificate of St. Gregory the Great is the crucial epoch in the history of the Roman Mass. He became Pope in 590 and reigned until 604. His achievements during those 14 years almost defy credibility and prominent among the many important reforms that he undertook was that of the liturgy, which in every important respect is, was left in the state that is found in the fifth Missal of 1570. The keynote of his reform was fidelity to the traditions that had been handed down. The root meaning of the Latin word traditio is to hand over or hand down. The order of mass that we'll be taking part in up in the church a little later is very, very close to what's found in the Missal of St. Gregory the Great. And from the early Middle Ages onwards, there's very little to chronicle uh, about change in the, in the order of Mass itself. The Mass, as we have it today, was regarded as a sacred and inviolable uh, inheritance, and its origins were forgotten in the mist, mist, mists of times. The 16th century Protestant reformers broke with the tradition of the church by the very fact of initiating a drastic reform of liturgical rites. And this would have been the case even if their liturgies had been orthodox. The nature of their heresy was made clear not so much by what their rites contained as by what they omitted from the traditional books. In 1898, the Anglican bishops of England published a defence of the liturgical reform initiated by Thomas Cranner and the other English reformers, and the English bishops claimed that all Cranner had done was, was to try and return to primitive usage. The Catholic bishops responded in very, very vigorous language, and they denied the right of national or local churches to devise their own rights. This is what the Catholic bishops said. They must not omit or reform anything in those forms which immemorial tradition has bequeathed to us. For such an immemorial usage, whether or not it has in the course of ages incorporated superfluous accretions, must, in the estimation of those who believe in a divinely guarded visible church, at least have retained whatever is necessary, so that, in adhering rigidly to the right handed down to us, we can always feel secure, whereas, if we omit or change anything, we may perhaps be abandoning just that element which is essential, and this sound method is that which the Catholic Church has always followed. That in earlier times, local churches were permitted to add new prayers and ceremonies is acknowledged, but that they were also permitted to subtract prayers and ceremonies in previous use, and even to remodel the existing rites in the most drastic manner is a proposition for which we know of no historical foundations, and which appears to us absolutely incredible. Hence, Cranmer, in taking this unprecedented course, acted, in our opinion, with the most inconceivable rashness. The Missal of Pope St. Pius V was compiled and published in 1570 in obedience to the Fathers of the Council of Trent and as a response to the liturgical revolution initiated by the Protestant reformers. In its 18th session, the Council had appointed a commission to examine the Missal, to revise it and restore it according to the custom and right of the Holy Fathers. 
Father Fortescue makes particular mention of the liturgical continuity which characterized the new missal. The missal of St. Pius V was not simply a personal decree of the sovereign pontiff, but an act of the Council of Trent, even though the Council closed on the 4th of December 1563, before the commission had completed its task. The matter was remitted to Pope Pius IV, but he died before the work was concluded, so that it was his successor, St. Pius V, who promulgated the missal resulting from the Council, with the ball, quote, primum tempore, the 14th of July, 1570. This was the first time during the entire 1,570 years of the Church's history that a council or a pope had actually used written legislation to specify and impose a complete rite of mass. It would be impossible to lay too much stress upon the fact that St. Pius V did not promulgate a new order of mass, a Novus Ordo Missae. The keynote of his reform, like that of St. Gregory, was fidelity to tradition. The Catholic instinct has been to hold fast to what has been handed down and to look with novel, upon any novelty with the utmost suspicion. The beauty, the worth, the perfection of the Roman liturgy of the Mass, so universally acknowledged and admired, was described by Father Frederick Faber as the most beautiful thing this side of heaven. He continues, It came forth out of the grand mind of the Church and lifted us out of earth and out of self and wrapped us round in a cloud of mystical sweetness, and the sublimities of a more than angelic liturgy, and purified us almost without ourselves, and charmed us with celestial charming, so that our very senses seemed to find vision, hearing, fragrance, taste and touch, beyond what earth can give. After the reform of St. Pius V, just as had been the case before it, the mass of the Roman rite was regarded as a sacred trust to be handed on to each new generation, just as it had been received. The bull quo primum, contrary to what some traditional Catholics think, did not preclude any revision or any reform of the Roman rite. St. Pius X reformed the Gregorian notation. Pope Pius XII reformed the Holy Week ceremonies. But that, that the idea that the entire Mass could be subjected to a radical reform was considered absolutely inconceivable up to and during the Second Vatican Council. Uh, and I'm going to show you later that the reform enacted in the name of Vatican II was in no way mandated by Vatican II. If we are to understand the liturgical revolution that followed the Second Vatican Council, we must go back to the year 1912, to the little town of Civitale di Lego, uh, obviously in Italy, where a son was born to the Bunini family, and he was named Annibale. From an early age, he evinced an interest in the priesthood. He studied theology in the Congregation of the Missions, that's the Vincentians, and in 1928 he was ordained in this order. For ten years he did parish work in a Roman suburb, and then from 1947 to 1957 he worked uh, uh, in editing the missionary publications of his order. And in 1947 he began to be actively involved in the field of specialised liturgical uh, studies, and uh, he was appointed secretary to Pope Pius XII's Commission for Liturgical Reform in 1948, also professor of liturgy in the Pontifical Propaganda Fide uh, University, a consultant of the Sacred Congregation of Rites, and professor of sacred liturgy in the Lateran University. Then, in 1960, Father Bunini was placed in a position which would enable him to exert a disastrous influence upon the history of the Church. He was appointed secretary to the Preparatory Commission for the Liturgy of the Second Vatican Council. Bunini was the moving spirit behind the drafting of the Preparatory Schema on the Liturgy, the draft document which was, which was to be placed before the Council Fathers for discussion. Carlo Falcone, an ex-priest who's also left the church but keeps in close contact with all his friends in the Vatican, refers to this preparatory schema as the Bunini draft. It is of the greatest possible importance to bear in mind the fact that, it, as was stressed in his own uh, journal, Notizie, uh, the liturgy constitution which the Council Fathers eventually passed was substantially identical with the draft schema which Bunini had st steered through the preparatory commission. Although his schema was accepted by a plenary session of the Liturgical Preparatory Commission in a vote taken on the 13th of January 1962, the President of the Commission, the 80-year-old Cardinal Caetano Cicognani, probably pronounced that incorrectly, had the foresight to realize the dangers implicit in certain passages. The program of reform was so vast that it caused the Cardinal to hesitate, and unless he could be persuaded to sign the schema, it would be blocked. Father Bunini needed to act. 
he arranged for immediate approaches to be made to Pope John, who agreed to intervene. He called Cardinal Amleto Cicognani, his Secretary of State, and the younger brother of Cardinal Caetano, and told him to visit his brother and not leave him until the schema had been signed. The Cardinal complied. Apparatus of the Liturgical Preparatory Commission later remarked, the old Cardinal was almost in tears. He waved the document in the air and said, they want me to sign this, but I don't know if I want to. Then he laid the document on his desk, picked up a pen, and signed a death warrant for the traditional Mass of the Roman Rite, the most beautiful thing this side of heaven. Four days later, the old Cardinal died. The Bunini schema had been saved, and only just in time, uh, because with the approval of Pope John, and to the outrage of liberal Catholics throughout the world, Father Bunini was mysteriously dismissed from his chair at the Lat Lateran University, and from the secretaryship of the Liturgical Preparatory Commission. The reasons which prompted Pope John to take this step have never been divulged, but they must have been of a very, very serious nature to make this rather tolerant pontiff act in so public and drastic a manner against a priest who had occupied so prominent and influential a position in the preparation for, his, for the council. In his book, Pope John and His Council, Carlo Falcone condemns the dismissal of Father Bunini as a retrograde step, but adds with satisfaction, all the same. Bunini managed to get his draft through as far as the council, and now it will be interesting to see if it is passed, and even more so if the draft schema of the prescribed secretary of the liturgical commission should open the way for the success of other drafts of a pro progressive character. It was, and it did. The dismissal of Father Bunini was very much a case of locking the stable door after the horse had bolted. He had taken it for granted that he would be appointed a secretary to the Conciliar Liturgical Commission so that he could guide his schema through the council, but this was not essential as long as it received the approval of the council fathers without any radical modifications, and he had drafted it in a manner which he was sure would do this. As I explained in my first lecture, Pope John had the first seven preparatory schemas sent to the Council Fathers around the world prior to the opening of the session, but in response to an intervention by Father Skillebeeks, only the Bunini scheme was found acceptable for discussion. Uh, Skillebeeks enthused, it was, he said, an admirable piece of work. I mentioned earlier that Bunini had drafted his schema in a manner which he was sure would make it acceptable to the Council Fathers, even to the most conservative among them and his confidence was more than justified. Cardinal Heenan cites the liturgy constitution, or the schema for it, as an example of a text which was open to an interpretation very different from that intended by the fathers who endorsed it by an almost unanimous, excuse me, by an almost unanimous vote. This is what Cardinal Heenan wrote. I'd like you to listen to this very, very carefully. At the close of the first session, little had been decided, but many ideas had been ventilated. The subject most fully debated was liturgical reform. It might be more accurate to say that the bishops were under the impression that the liturgy had been fully discussed. In retrospect, it is clear that they were given the opportunity of discussing only general principles. Now listen to this. Subsequent changes were more radical than those intended by Pope John and the bishops who passed the decree on the liturgy. His sermon at the end of the first session shows that Pope John did not suspect what was being planned by the liturgical experts. Well, this statement is completely unambiguous. It was made by one of the most active and erudite council fathers, and he tells us that Father Bunini and some of his fellow Pariti had engaged in a conspiracy to deceive Pope John and the council. If we examine the finalised version of the Bunini schema voted for almost unanimously a sacrosanctum concilium, the liturgy constitution of the council, it's not hard to see why it was understood, uh, uh, why it was acceptable even to traditional bishops. By no stretch, possible stretch of the imagination would these bishops have believed that the constitution could be interpreted as mandating or sanctioning the destruction of the Roman rite and the sanctuaries in which it was celebrated. It contains stipulations which appear to make any drastic remodeling of the traditional mass impossible. The Latin language was to be preserved in the Latin rites, Article 36. 
steps would be taken so that the faithful could sing or say together Latin in those parts of the Mass that pertained to them. Article 54. All lawfully acknowledged rights were held to be of equal authority and dignity, were to be preserved in the future and fostered in every way. Article 4. The treasury of sacred music was to be preserved and fostered with great care. Article 114. Gregorian chant was to be given pride of place in, in liturgical services. There were to be no innovations unless the good of the church genuinely and certainly required them. And care was to be taken that any new forms adopted should grow in some way organically from forms already existing. But, you're falling in what I said, Professor Coleman said in my last talk, every statement that seems to make one point of view is opposed by one giving another. Uh, it also said that where necessary, the rights be thoroughly revised in the light of sound tradition, and that they be given new vigour to meet the circumstances and needs of modern times. It also said, in the restoration of the promotion of the sacred liturgy, the full and active participation by all the people is the aim to be considered before else. It said the rights should be distinguished by noble simplicity. They should be short, clear, and unencumbered by useless repetitions. They should be within the people's power of comprehension and normally not require much explanation. I cited Article 36 requiring that the Latin language be preserved in the Latin rites, but the same article gave permission for the use of the vernacular in the Mass and the sacraments to be extended. <coughs> Reference was made to the readings, some of the prayers and chants. The idea that the whole Mass would ever be said in the vernacular didn't e it occur to anyone there. Cardinal Montini made an intervention. He said it was absolutely unthinkable that the canon should ever be recited in anything except the sacred language of, uh, of Latin. Then he allowed uh, five, four new canons of, of the Mass, so, and the Roman canon all be said in, in the vernacular. Uh, you see, a careful reading of Article 36 will show you the Second Vatican Council does not order that one word of the Mass should ever be said in the vernacular. But carry on with a careful reading, and you see it doesn't exclude any, any part of the Mass, which, which is quite a time bomb. Then, here are some terrible parts. Provided that the substantial unity of the Roman Rite is maintained, the revision of the liturgical book should allow for legitimate variations and adaptations to different groups, regions, and peoples, especially in the mission lands. Now, nobody explains what on earth this, this, this is meant. And then it goes on to say, in some places, an even more radical adaptation of the liturgy is needed. So it's not said what a radical adaptation is, but it says you might need an even more radical adaptation. Uh, and all this, you see, has to be done by the commissions that will be set up after the council. They're the people who are going to interpret this. Now, confining our... Uh, oh, I'll just read you one more. And this is, you can see, this could be a... a mandate to d change the whole, whole mass and destroy it. The right of mass is to be revised in such a way that the intrinsic nature and purpose of its several parts, as also the connection between them, can be more clearly manifested and that devout and active participation by the congregation can be more easily accomplished. For this purpose, the rights are to be simplified while due care is taken to preserve their substance. Elements which, with the passage of time, came to be duplicated duplicated or were added with little advantage are now to be discarded. I'll just repeat that, that sentence again. Elements which with the passage of time came to be duplicated or were added with little advantage are now to be discarded. Confining ourselves to the ordinary of the Mass, that's the part that stays the same every day, we must ask whether in fact there are any parts which with the passage of time came to be du duplicated or, with or were added with very little advantage. And I would insist that no such parts exist. The survival of the virtually unchanged 1570 Missal until 1965 was, even from a cultural standpoint, something of a miracle. It would not be an exaggeration to describe this Missal as the most sublime product of Western civilization, more perfect in its balance, rich in its imagery, inspiring, consoling and instructive than even the most beautiful cathedral in Europe. It should not be a matter of surprise that when Pius V finally codified the Roman Rite of Mass, he enshrined the jewel of our faith in a setting of more than human perfection, a mystic veil worthy of the divine mystery which it enveloped. Nicholas Wiseman was appointed as the first English cardinal and the first Archbishop of Westminster following the restoration of the Catholic hierarchy in England and Wales by Blessed Pius IX in 1850. 
This great pastor and scholar wrote concerning the Mass that he celebrated each day of his PC life, and I'm quoting Cardinal Wiseman now, if we examine each prayer separately, it is perfect. Perfect in construction, perfect in thought, and perfect in expression. If we consider the manner in which they are brought together, we are struck with the brevity of each, with the sudden but beautiful transitions, and the almost stanza-like effect with which they succeed one another, forming a lyrical composition of surpassing beauty. If we take the entire service as a whole, it is constructed with the most admirable symmetry, proportioned in its parts with perfect judgment, and so exquisitely arranged as to excite and preserve an unbroken interest in the sacred action. No doubt to give full force and value to this sacred rite, its entire ceremonial is to be considered. The assistants with their noble vestments, the chant, the incense, the more varied ceremonies which belong to a solemn mass are all calculated to increase veneration and admiration. But still, the essential beauties remain whether the holy rite be performed under the golden vault of St. Peter's or in a wretched wigwam erected in haste by some poor savages for their miss- missionary. Uh, I could cite such passages indefinitely, but if, as Cardinal Wiseman expressed it, if a liturgical rite is perfect in construction, perfect in thought, and perfect in expression, it's hard to understand how it contains parts that are added with little advantage. Article 23, which I already quoted you, states that there are to be no innovations unless the good of the Church genuinely and certainly requires them. So, I think during our daily Mass here at the Symposium, I wonder if anyone has noticed one prayer or one ceremony that you could say the good of the Church genuinely and certainly required for, should be abolished. Take, for example, a station, the, the, sorry, take, for example, the signs of the cross in the canon of the Mass. There are 26 signs of the cross in the canon in the 1962 Missal, and only two in the 1970 Missal. I don't know if it's simply a coincidence that Thomas Cranmer reduced the signs of the cross from 26 to 2 in his 1549 communion service. Now it can be added, you're quite correctly, that the validity of the Mass doesn't require a single sign of the cross to be made in the canon or anywhere else in the Mass if it comes to that. But the question is, if we're going to obey the Council, did the good of the Church genuinely and certainly require that these signs of the cross should be abolished? If Father Barrero decided not to make all these signs today, uh, and they have all been abolished, but for two, in the, in the Roman canon, in the new Mass. Well, if he did say, well, I'll go along with that. He just made two signs of the cross. Would your participation in the Mass be intensified? Would you become more fervent Catholics? Would you become imbued with a superabundance of supernatural charity? And the same question can be asked of every other change made to the 1962 Missal. How on earth can it be said that the good of the Church required the abolition of the Eudicame? the sublime offertory prayers, the last gospel. You remember the council required that any innovations had to go out of already parts of the Mass already existing. Well, these, these prayers we have at the offertory now, they're a Jewish form of grace. They don't grow out of anything that existed in the Catholic liturgy, all this stuff about the fruit of human hands. So in my opinion, there is not one prayer, not one gesture, not one sign of the cross in the Mass celebrated here each day by Father Barrero that could by any stretch of the imagination be said to be required to be abolished for the good of the Church. And if I'm correct, the Missal of 1970 must be seen as a massive and calculated act of defiance of the liturgy constitution of the Second Vatican Council. Then how and why were these changes imposed upon us? And the answer, of course, was given by Cardinal Heenan. Uh, during the debate on the pastoral constitution, guide him at space, joy and hope. <laughs> That's me. We haven't had much joy and hope since the council. But, uh, and he warned the fathers to scrutinize the text with great care before voting on them because of the danger that, and I've quoted this before, the mind of the council will have to be interpreted to the world by the Pariti who helped the fathers of the commission to draw up the documents. God forbid that this should happen. I fear Pariti when they are left to explain what the bishops meant. It is of no avail to talk about a college of bishops if Pariti in articles, books and speeches contradict and pour scorn on what the body of bishops teaches. What Cardinal Heenan feared would happen, happened. The confidence of the liberals that they would dominate the post-conciliar commissions was more than justified. 
On the 5th of March 1964, the Osservatore Romano <laughs> announced the establishment of the Commission for the Implementation of the Constitution on the Liturgy. And it became known as the Concilium. It, it, it just means a committee. The initial membership, and I'm, I'm quoting to the Osservatore Romano, the initial me- membership consisted of members of uh, the Bunini Commission, which had drafted the Constitution, and believe it or not, and this I find absolutely astonishing, Pope Paul VI appointed Bunini as secretary of the Post-Conciliar Commission on the 29th of February 1964. He was thus placed in a position to interpret the document that he had drafted with the intention of deceiving the popes and the bishops in the way he intended to develop it. And I just find it quite unbelievable how a man who had been dismissed by Pope John XXIII, which must have been very, very serious for reasons to remove him from the secretaryship of the, of, of, of the preparatory commission, to remove him from the Lateran University, how the, John XXIII's successor could reappoint him to that very position. It's, it's, it's a great mystery. In theory, Bunini's concilium was an advisory body, and the reforms it devised had to be implemented by the Sacred Congregation for Rites, or the Sacred Congregation for the Discipline of the Sacraments. And Father Bunini's power was increased when he was appointed under secretary to the Sacred Congregation of Rites. And on the 8th of May 1969, Pope Paul promulgated the Apostolic Constitution, Sacra Rituum Congregatio, which ended the existence of Bunini's concilium as a separate body by incorporating it into the Congregation for Divine Worship as a special commission which would retain its members and consultors and remain until the reform of the liturgy had been committed. And who do you think was appointed to be the all-powerful secretary of this congregation? None other than Father Annibale Bunini. And it's no, uh, certainly no exaggeration to claim that what had happened in effect was that his concilium, his committee, in other words, Father Bunini himself, had taken over the sacred congregation for divine worship, so that the great architect of the revolution was now able to consolidate and extend the revolution behind which he had been the moving spirit and principle of continuity. Nominal heads of commissions, congregations, and the concilium came and went. Cardinal Lucaro, Cardinal Gutt, Cardinal Tabera, Cardinal Knox, but Father Bunini always remained and his services were rewarded by elevating him to the rank of titular Archbishop of Diocletiana on the 7th of January 1972. Cardinal Heenan remarked bitterly, There is a certain poetic justice and the humiliation of the Catholic Church at the hands of the liturgical anarchists. Catholics used to laugh at Anglicans for being high or low. The old boast that the Mass is everywhere the same and that Catholics are happy whichever priest celebrates is no longer true. When on the 7th of December 1962 the bishops voted overwhelmingly in favour of the first chapter of the Constitution on the Liturgy, they did not know that they were initiating a process which, after the Council, would cause confusion and bitterness throughout the Church. Confusion and bitterness, these are the fruits of the practical implementation of the Liturgy Constitution, which no Catholic who loves the Church, who loves the Mass, who loves the faith of his fathers, has been able to escape. Uh, The 7th of December 1962 is one of the blackest days in the history of the Church. Had any council father been told how Mass would be celebrated in a typical parish today, his reaction would almost certainly have been that of Archbishop R.J. Dwyer of Portland, Oregon, who commented on that fateful day with the benefit of hindsight in 1973, Who dreamed on that day, that's the day they voted for the Liturgy Constitution, who dreamed on that day that within a few years, far less than a decade, the Latin past of the Church would be all but expunged, that it would be reduced to a memory fading in the middle distance? The thought of it would have horrified us, but it seemed so far beyond the realm of possibility as to be ridiculous, so we laughed it off. Thus, when certain conciliar texts are interpreted in a manner which appears to be in direct conflict with Catholic teaching and tradition, the natural reaction is to explain, exclaim, but could that, have, could, could that possibly have been intended? And as far as the intention of the majority of council fathers is concerned, such a judgment would certainly be true. But, to quote Archbishop Dwyer again, the great mistake of the Council Fathers was to allow the implementation of the Constitution on the sacred liturgy to fall into the hands of men who are either unscrupulous or incompetent. This is the so-called liturgical establishment, 
A sacred cow which acts more like a white elephant as it trembles on the shards of a shattered liturgy with ponderous abandon. The great mistake of the Council Fathers was, in fact, voting for the Constitution with virtual unanimity. Only four bishops uh, voted against it. But as Cardinal Heenan explained, they did not suspect what the liturgical experts were planning. Once the bishops had returned to their diocese and Bunini, Bunini and his gang obtained co- total control over the liturgy of the Roman Rite, whatever they had mandated was certain to receive papal approbation and to be implemented automatically by the church bureaucracy throughout the world. Uh, I know that Dietrich von Hildebrand has pointed out in his book The Trojan Horse in the City of God this unfortunate mentality where people just th- think of themselves as being, say, in a political bureaucracy. Someone higher than you says do this, so you just do it. And so, and I mentioned, I'm not going to start you know, going too much about Freemasons, but in the document of the Alta Vendita, they said the Catholic Church is the organization in the world best suited to be destroyed by a revolution if it comes from above. Uh, so, to the best of my knowledge, the only prelate in the entire world who made any attempt to preserve the traditional Mass was in fact Cardinal Heenan who persuaded the Pope to allow it to continue to be celebrated on a limited basis in England and Wales, as it was the Mass used by the martyrs of these countries, and the people had a great devotion to it. Bunini made no secret of of his anger at at this concession. So actually, there's never been a time when the traditional Mass wasn't celebrated with official approval, thanks to that. On the 3rd of April, 1969, another black day in the history of the Church, Pope Paul VI announced in his apostolic con- constitution, Missale Romanum, that the Missal promulgated in 1570 by his illustrious predecessor, St. Pius V, was to be replaced by one promulgated on his own authority. Pope Paul VI actually believed that he could improve upon the perfection of the Missal of St. Pius V, and he broke, and this is very important, he broke with the invariable tradition of all his predecessors to do something hitherto unknown in the history of the church in the east or in the west with the single exception of the Protestant Reformation he authorized a remodeling of the existing rites in the most drastic manner including the composition of a new order of mass a novus order missae it's claimed that all this was done in obedience to the Second Vatican Council. Today's all-powerful liturgical bureaucrats expect us to be taken in by the oldest and most evident non-sequitur of all, post hoc ergo propter hoc, because the change followed the Council and must have been mandated by the Council. Thus, in the United States of a beautiful sanctuary built in the last century through the devotion and sacrifices of poor immigrants is vandalized by liturgical barbarians, and the descendants of those immigrants have the temerity to ask whether the destruction was absolutely necessary, they are denounced as opponents of the council and cast into the outer darkness. Far from preserving and fostering the Roman rite as the council required, it has been destroyed, and the treasury of sacred music, Gregorian chant in particular, has been all but forgotten in the majority of parishes. Young people throughout the world are being drawn in millions to the sublime beauty of Gregorian chant, but alas, they find it in record shops, not in Catholic churches. There's not a single word in a single council document which even hints at the possibility of completely vernacular masses, mass facing the people, tearing tabernacles from the high altar, smashing sanctuary rails, smashing altars and replacing them with tables, standing for communion, communion in the hand, Communion under both kinds on Sundays, extraordinary ministers of communion, altar girls, inclusive language, clan masses, dancing girls, let alone dancing boys in pink leotards, which uh, happens at Mass in Chicago, uh, banjos, balloons. What have these practices possibly got to do with the making present of the sacrifice of Calvary? The passion of the Lord is the sacrifice we offer, wrote St. Cyprian. Would the bishops who allow these practices, if they'd been present at Calvary when our Lord was dying on the cross, would they have united themselves with his passion by allowing clowns to perform or bringing on dancing girls? As I've already explained, the new order of mass, the Novus Ordo Missae, concocted by Father Buny in East Concilium, was not so much envisaged, let alone mandated by the fathers of the Second Vatican Council, who would most certainly not have voted for it as it stands to say. You don't have to take my word for this. I, I want to quote uh, a man who's possibly the greatest liturgist of the second half of this century, uh, the late Monsignor Klaus Gamber, 
If you haven't read his book, The Reform of the Roman Liturgy, you ought to get it. Uh, he, he, he was described by Cardinal Ratzinger as the one scholar who, among the army of pseudo-liturgists, truly represents the liturgical thinking at the centre of the church. And as regards the attitude the Council Fathers would have taken to the changes that have been foisted upon us, he writes, one statement we can make with cert- certainty is that the new order of mass that has now emerged would not have been endorsed by the majority of the Council Fathers. Monsignor Gamber insists correctly that what we have experienced is not a renewal, but a debacle that worsens with each passing year. I'll quote him again. The liturgical reform, welcomed with so much idealism and hope by so many priests and lay people alike, has turned out to be a liturgical destruction of startling proportions, a debacle worsening with each passing year. Instead of the hopeful renewal of the church and of Catholic life, we are now witnessing a dismantling of the traditional values and piety on which our faith rests. Instead of the fruitful renewal of the liturgy, what we see is the destruction of the forms of the Mass which had developed organically during the course of many centuries. Uh, and I think this great liturgist, he wasn't exaggerating when he used the word destruction. And this could be made clear by citing uh, the opinion of someone from the opposite end of the theological or liturgical spectrum, Father Joseph Gellinau, a French priest. Some of you might even remember the Gellinau Psalms when, when they were introduced. Uh, he was described by Archbishop Unini as one of the great masters of the international liturgical world, which of course means he agreed with Archbishop Unini. Uh, and Gellinau was one of the most influential members of the Concilium, and he wrote a book uh, called uh, Demand the Liturgy, the Liturgy of Tomorrow, and he commended, with, with, he commented really with commendable honesty, but not the least sign of regret, this is what he says. Let those who, like myself, have known and sung a Latin Gregorian High Mass remember it if they can. Let them compare it with the Mass that we now have. Not only the words, the melodies, and some of the gestures are different. To tell the truth, it is a different liturgy of the Mass. This needs to be said without ambiguity. The Roman rite, as we knew it, no longer exists. The Rite Roman tel que nous l'avons connu n'existe plus. It has been destroyed, il est détruit. So the council commanded that all lawfully acknowledged rights were to be held, were to be preserved in the future and fostered in every way. Father Gellinau testifies, who is better qualified to do so, that the Roman right has been destroyed. And how you preserve and foster a right by destroying it is something that even Archbishop Junini might have found hard to explain. Father Gallinau has also testified to the fact that the liturgical revolution which followed the Council went far beyond what the Council Fathers intended, and his testimony must surely be conclusive. He writes, It would be false to identify this liturgical renewal with the reform of rites decided on by Vatican II. This reform goes back much further and goes forward far beyond the conciliar prescriptions of Vabien de la. The liturgy... This is his verdict on the liturgy we now have. The liturgy is a permanent workshop. The liturgy est un chantier permanent. By 1974, Bunini was able to boast that his liturgical reform had been a major conquest of the Catholic Church. Then, at the very moment when his power had reached its zenith, Archbishop Bunini was summarily dismissed to the dismay of liberal Catholics throughout the world, it was not simply that the Archbishop had been dismissed, his entire congregation was dissolved and merged with the Congregation for the Sacraments under the terms of Pope Paul's Apostolic Constitution, Constans Nobis, published in the Zorite Romano English edition on the 31st of July, 1975. The name Bunini did not appear in any of the appointments to this new congregation, and liberals throughout the entire world were dismayed uh, a journalist you might have heard of, uh, Desmond O'Grady, who writes the tablet in Europe, the National Tablet Report in the United States. Uh, this is what he said in his column, which appeared in, in, in a lot of papers. Archbishop Annibale Bunini, who is secretary of the abolished Congregation for Divine Worship, was the key figure in the church's liturgical reform and is not a member of the new congregation, nor, despite his lengthy experience, was he consulted in the planning of it. 
The abrupt way in which this was done does not augur well for the Bunini line of encouragement for reform in collaboration with local authorities. Monsignor Bunini conceived the next ten years' work as concerned principally with the incorporation of local usages into the liturgy. He represented the continuity of the post-conciliar reform. And I've no time to go into it now, but in some countries like India, the ordinary faith were in despair. It hasn't been Indianized, the mass, it's been Hinduized. And it's hard to tell the difference between some masses and, and the rites of the Hindu religion. The Zoritari Romano carried the following announcement, its English edition, on the 15th of January, 1976. Uh, the Holy Father has appointed apostolic pronuncio in Iran, His Excellency, the Most Reverend Anibale Bunini CM, titular Archbishop of Diocletiana. This was interpreted by his supporters and his opponents as a sentence of exile. It came as no surprise when in April 1976, uh, Tito Cassini, who is Italy's leading Catholic writer, he publicly accused Monsignor Bunini of being a Freemason. Then, on the 8th of October, uh, in the same year, Le Figaro pu published a report stating that Bunini denied that he had ever had any Masonic affiliations. Well, I've made my own investigation into this matter, and I can vouch for the authenticity of the following facts. A Roman priest of the very highest reputation, uh, Don Luigi Villa, who lives in Brescia, I've been hoping to go and see him today, but it, ha it hasn't worked out. He's still alive and living in Brescia. He came into possession of evidence which he considered proved Monsignor Bunini to be a Freemason. He had this information placed into the hands of Pope Paul VI by a cardinal he knew, and he warned the cardinal that if the Pope didn't take action at once, he would be bound in conscience to make the matter public. Monsignor Bunini was immediately dismissed and his entire congregation dissolved. And in order to verify this, I got in touch with Don, Don Villa and I asked, uh, would he be willing to give me the information that he'd given to the Pope so that it could be published? And I got the following reply. I've got it in my book, Pope Paul's New Mass, in the Italian as well. But he said, I regret that I am unable to comply with your request. The secret which must, denounce, must surround the denunciation, in consequence of which Monsignor Bunini had to go, is top secret. And such it has to remain, for many reasons. The fact that the above-mentioned Monsignori was immediately dismissed from his post is sufficient. This means that the arguments are more than convincing. Now, what, something I want to make very clear here. The facts that I've been able to establish do not in any way prove that Archbishop Bunini was a Freemason. What I've been able to establish is the documentation purporting to prove that he was a Mason was placed into the hands of the Pope, who then dismissed the Archbishop and banished him to Iran. Um, Archbishop Bunini made a rather violent attack upon me in, in the May 1980 issue of the Homiletic and Pastoral Review, and he said, I'm a calumniator, and I have colleagues who are calumniators by profession. Well, it's probably right there, because the school I taught and all the other teachers were women, but... <laughs> Who, who tend to calumniate a bit now and then, but uh, uh, I don't know if that was what he meant. Anyway, he said, I, I, I'm a calumniator and I've got colleagues who are calumniators by profession. He denied that he'd ever been a Freemason, but as I've just explained, I didn't say that I could prove he was, only that he'd been dismissed by Pope Paul VI because Pope Paul VI believed him to have been a Mason. And then the Archbishop admitted this himself in his posthumous account of the liturgical reform which was published in Italian in 1983 and in English in 1990. On page 93 of, of the English edition of this book, he quoted from the letter of the hom homiletic in which he was condemning me as a calumniator. But he, he, on the same page, in page 91, he concedes precisely what I'd alleged. Referring to his dismissal and the suppression of the Congregation for Divine Worship, this is Bunini's account of it. What were the reasons that led the Pope to such a drastic decision which no one expected and which lay so heavily on the Church? I said uh, in the preface to this book that I myself never knew any of these reasons for sure, even though understandably in the distress of the moment I knocked on many doors at all levels. Towards the end of the summer, a cardinal, who was usually no enthusiast for liturgical reform, told me of the existence of a dossier which he had seen or brought to the Pope's desk which proved that Archbishop Unini was a Freemason. But in fairness to him, I'm going to say he denied that. He, this, he said that this was a conspiracy by people who wanted to undermine the credibility of his liturgical reform, which wouldn't be hard to do, because I don't think it had any credibility anyway. And personally, I regret that the question of Unini being a Mason has ever been raised. Uh, 
In, in his book, The Devastated Vineyard, published in 1973, Dietrich von Hildebrand observed, Truly, if one of the devils in C.S. Lewis's The Screw Tape Letters had been entrusted with the ruin of the liturgy, he could not have done it better. Now, this is a statement based on an objective assessment of reform itself. And it's beyond dispute that the Roman rite has been destroyed, uh, no matter whether it's been destroyed uh, deliberately or, or by people who reformed it with good intentions. Even if the result of, of what's happened to the liturgy is simply the consequence of ill-judged decisions by well-meaning men, the objective fact remains unchanged. They could not have destroyed the Roman rite more effectively had they done so deliberately. And the Masonic connection diverts the attention of many Catholics from this fact. They tend to think that the liturgical reform is bad because Bunini was a Mason, but if it could be proved that he was not a Mason, then one would you know, have to presume there's nothing to complain about. And it must also be stressed that although Archbishop Bunini could be said to be responsible for the liturgical reform in that he was the motivating fact, uh, he was the motivating uh, person behind it, it can't change the fact that Pope Paul VI must accept responsibility for it. He must accept what is called executive responsibility for all the official changes. Whether he liked them or not, he authorised them, and he didn't repudiate or revoke any of them. Uh, and, but however, in addition to just all authorising them, it's clear that, that he was enthusiastic about these changes. If you read Bunini's autobiography, you'll see he was in consultation with the Pope the whole time, and, and the Pope fully approved of it, uh, everything he did. Uh, but providentially, the Pope never went to the extent of using his full authority uh, to forbid the traditional Mass in a manner that would have been legally binding. The dismissal of Bunini from the Liturgical Preparatory Commission of the Vatican uh, achieved little, as I explained earlier, as it was closing the stable draft, the horse had gone, as the draft had already been completed and was uh, passed virtually unchanged. And you could say the same for his dismissal from the Congregation for Divine Worship. It just achieved very little because the new mass was already in place. His concilium, with the active help of six Protestant observers, transformed the rite of mass which St. Pius V had promulgated in perpetuity as a barrier against the Protestant heresy into a new order of mass, a Novus Ordo Missae, which was far more acceptable from a Protestant standpoint and which Cardinals Ottaviani and Bacci condemned. Uh, they said it had lowered the barriers to the Protestant heresy. While the Mass of Trent remained, there could be no hope of unity with Protestants. Almost all the prayers that had been removed by the Protestant reformers were removed by Father Bunini, no doubt upon the advice of his Protestant collaborators. If prayers such as the, the, the prayers at the foot of the altar, the Udicami, the Confiture, the Offertory prayers, the Plecce Tibi, the Last Gospel. He even removed the Roman Canon, but, but thank God, it was reinstated on the assistance of Pope Paul VI, but simply, uh, it simply is an option. Alice and I were talking about Paul VI in, in between the two, two lectures. You know, remember I mentioned you how he intervened and proclaimed Our Lady as Mother of the Church. Uh, uh, we have to see it as you know, the influence of the Ho 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 Holy Spirit that he, Pope Paul VI insisted that they put the Roman canon back in. So you can't actually say that in the new missal, any essential Catholic doctrines can't be found there because they're all found in the Roman canon. But of course, again, typical Vatican do compromise, the Roman canon is practically never used. Uh, now, Bunini denied that the Protestant observers did anything but observe. He actually stated they never spoke. They never once spoke, he said. But I wrote to one of them, uh, a canon Jasper, who was an Anglican observer, and I've got, I got a letter back from him saying there are two sorts of... Uh, meetings for the liturgy uh, concilium. In the mornings, they had what were called the working sessions, and they thrashed out what they were going to vote on in the afternoon. And he said, in those sessions, we took a very active part and expressed all our views. So, Bunini was just lying outright. So, when he denied that he was ever a Mason, one can take this into consideration. I've got in my book, Pope Paul's New Mass, I've got, I've got this letter quoted in a lot of other evidence. Uh, and but an Anglican, the Anglican observer, Archdeacon Paul, who I've quoted frequently, he's full of enthusiasm for the Bunini reform, which, he says, and if Archbishop of Ferris said this, people have been scandalised. He said it outstripped the liturgy of Cranmer in spite of the latter's 400-year start and its, uh, in its modernity. The Archdeacon states with great satisfaction that, and listen to this, it is above all this new liturgy which has changed relationships out of recognition, 
For the revised Roman liturgy, so far from being a cause of deception, now resembles the Anglican liturgy very closely. It is also, this is, I find this bit quite amusing, it has also demonstrated the value under certain conditions of an authoritarian government. For instead of the pains and agonies of experiments, objections, and a multitude of parallel revisions existing at the same time, the new Roman liturgy came into existence simultaneously all over the world. So, Paul the Sixth was able to get an ecumenical pat on the back for that. But I'm very pleased to say that the Archdeacon was somewhat premature in taking satisfaction of the lack of objections to the revised liturgy. Some of you might know that the Univocci Federation was inaugurated on the 19th of December 1964, and it began objecting at that time to the mutilation of our Mass, uh, which its members clearly saw that these uh, mutilations were being made so they would no longer be a cause of dissension for Protestants, and, and it's been objecting ever since. Then in 1970, with full Vatican approval, Archbishop Lefebvre established his seminary at Acone, which has effectively guaranteed the survival of the traditional Mass. And then on the 2nd of July, 1988, uh, Pope John Paul II promulgated his motu proprio Ecclesia Dei, in which he expressed his will to guarantee respect for the rightful aspirations. And that's interesting. Any, it, our rightful aspirations, for the rightful aspirations of those attached to the Latin liturgical tradition. Uh, before that, we were like a bunch of quasi-Protestants or lunatics, if you like, the uh, traditional mass. But now it's been changed to rightful aspirations. And in order to achieve this aim, he established the Pontifical Commission Ecclesia Dei. Many bishops have responded to this admonition in a very positive manner, and where this is the case, there are no longer any restrictions attached to the celebration of the Tridentine Mass. Hundreds of such Masses are celebrated in parish churches in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and throughout the United States. And they're scheduled private Masses, fulfilling the Sunday obligation, and any member of the faithful is welcome to attend them. But... On the other hand, many bishops, in fact most bishops, one has to say, have defied the clearly expressed will of the Pope and refused to permit the traditional Mass in their diocese. And it must be remembered that the Motu Probe Ecclesia Dei was issued in conjunction with the excommunication of Archbishop Lefebvre and its primary aim was to persuade the faithful who supported the Archbishop to stop supporting and come to these indult Masses. Uh, so... The fact that most of the people who supported it haven't done this uh, doesn't change the fact that we've got these indult masses, mainly thanks to Archbishop Lefebvre. So whatever attitude you take to him, you should say a, uh, a prayer for him every day for getting us what we've got. Uh, I'm sure the provost of the L- Brompton Arch in London, where they have a tried end time mass every Sunday, uh, he said to me, everything we've got, we owe it to the Archbishop. So... There can, can't be any doubt whatsoever that the liturgical reform has not resulted in the abundant pastoral fruits that the Council Fathers had so confidently predicted. In the United States alone, mass attendance has collapsed from 71% in 1963 to 25% in 1993, which is a decline of 65%. If we consider this in its true perspective of, of, uh, as a loss of souls to the Church, it means that 25 million Catholics who were assisting at Mass in the bad old days when we were supposed to have been alienated by an unintelligible Latin liturgy which meant nothing to us, choose not to assist at the vibrant, renewed and comprehensible liturgy of Archbishop Unini. Far from filling our churches with renewed, revitalized Catholics, many of them previously lapsed but brought back to the faith by an inspiring new liturgy that they could understand, we have witnessed a catastrophic decline in mass attendance in every Western country. It seems reasonable to ask in such countries as Holland whether anything substantially exists now that can be called Catholic. Uh, Father Louis Bouillet, who I've quoted several times, the French oratorian, he assures us he says, we're witnessing not the renewal, but the accelerating decomposition of Catholicism. And yet, according to those in authority, the liturgical reform has been a tremendous pastoral success. I'm sorry to say, once again, the most prominent among these is Pope John Paul II. Uh, He's always speaking of the abundant fruits that the reformers produce. It was last year the Spanish bishops made their ad limina visit to Rome, and the Pope says to them the liturgical reform has produced abundant fruits fruits in Spain as it has throughout the world. And mass attendance in Spain is is just collapsing. The Second Vatican Council has been followed by revolutionary changes in every aspect of Catholic life, but 
As Father Baker, editor of the Homiletic and Pastoral Review, has expressed it, it is the liturgical revolution which touches all of us intimately and immediately. Until this revolution has been overturned, there can be no hope of a restoration of normality to the Church. The present crisis cannot be overcome without restoring the liturgy that developed and endured for 19 centuries as the liturgy that will form the basis of the Church's worship in the 21st century. And uh, with this in mind, uh, I'd like to conclude by quoting Monsignor Gamber again. And what Monsignor Gamber said was, In the final analysis, this means that in the future, the traditional rite of Mass must be retained in the Roman Catholic Church as the primary liturgical form for the celebration of Mass. It must become once more the norm of our faith and the symbol of Catholic unity throughout the world a rock of stability in a period of upheaval and never-ending change. And although this might seem like an impossible dream, it isn't. Uh, On uh, Tuesday of this week, I was in the ceremony of the Institute of Christ the King in Guicciliano. Well, it was an indescribably beautiful uh, rite of ordination. It took three and a half hours, and... One just can't describe the, the liturgy of it. It really, really was heavenly, as, as, as Father Faber said. And the ordinations were conferred by Cardinal Medina Estevez, who's the head of the Congregation for Divine Worship. And you can't possibly exaggerate the significance of this fact that that was Purini's congregation. And the Purini, the poor man, he must be stirring in his grave or, uh, to think that the prefect of the Congregation uh, for Divine Worship would come and consecrate young priests who are going to devote their whole lives to celebrating the traditional Mass. And he, he said, I came here to show you that the Vatican Curia supports the traditional Mass and the traditional uh, priesthood. And th- that really cheered everyone up so much. And uh, he got tremendous applause when he came out of the church. And he was smiling and very, very, very happy. And this is a tremendous turnaround. Four years ago, if anyone said that the prefect of the Congregation for Divine Worship would one day consecrate priests for the traditional Mass, I would have mortgaged my house and put all the money on a bet that it, it, could, it could never possibly happen. So, in one way, as Fred Astaire said, things are looking up. But on the other hand, what is so sad, you see, is that, that people, that there's a hemorrhage in membership of the Church. We're losing people by millions. Perhaps in the United States every year, perhaps five, ten thousand people start coming to the uh, traditional mass. But the mainstream church is, is just vanishing. In England and Wales, within 20 years, there won't be any. There'll just be a handful of traditionalists and perhaps some charismatics. In 1965, two and a half million people went to mass. Less than a million go now, and it's going down by 50,000 a year, which means 20 years, there won't be anybody. So although we can rejoice in the fact that the traditional Mass has been preserved, as Catholics, we must be, you know, heartbroken to see you know, that our church is vanishing. And these people, most of them aren't going into Protestant sects, they're just joining, you know, the mainstream, uh, so the hedonistic, materialistic life, which we see in the West today. Well, I've got one more bit, I'll just, I'm going to read you, end up on a depressing note. They had, in 1980, they had the uh, Synod of Bishops, uh, to uh, assess the effects of the, uh, of the reform. And uh, their, concluding re- their concluding remarks were that the, they were, we are grateful to see with God's help that we have achieved all the aims. We have celebrated Vatican II wholeheartedly together as a grace of God and gift of the Spirit, Holy Spirit from which many spiritual benefits have issued for the universal church for particular churches and for the people of our time. For this reason, we have decided to go forward on the same path that the Council pointed out. And I commentate in, in this preface to my book, Pope John's Council, that's exactly what the leaders of a bunch of lemmings could say while they were rushing off the cliff. <laughs> and that is our great problem, that the, you know, the leaders in our church still insist that Vatican II has been a tremendous success. And every day, in every way, things are getting better and better. Which I think we'd agree is not the case. And so, when you go to Mass today, just have a look at and see if there's anything you think the good of the Church genuinely and you absolutely required to be admitted. And if any of you would be kind enough to buy this book, you'll see a, a happy little lady out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks very much. And, 
Thank you.